the Bible to the cross from the cross. Every Bible story has three components. First, God's law. Second, God's compassion. Third, God's miracle. Opening your Bible opens miracles. The Bible as one story is holy enough in our lives. Day 152, Psalms 91-102, singing a new song. The psalmist commanded persons and countries of the entire world to give praise and glory to the Lord who is full of honor, majesty, power, and beauty. First point, the psalmist teaches those who are in distress to find their refuge and shelter in God. The Bible teaches that one who seeks God will receive his love. One who has their heart towards God will be the one to receive his blessing. The psalmist in Psalm 91 is a blessing poured unto a person of God. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and lampart. The psalmist writes that those who trust in God will receive His protection, and those who hold on to God's promise will find joy and peace in their hearts. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Later, Satan makes reference to Psalm 91 verse 12 during his test. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Second point, the psalmist praised God for granting him his grace in the morning and his sincerity in the night. In Psalm 92, the psalmist does not complain about the prosperity of the wicked, but rather focuses on praising God. This stress about the wicked prospering was discussed in Psalm 37 and also Psalm 73, as well as in the book of Habakkuk. But the psalmist here does not complain about the wicked, but rather has faith that God will deal with them in his own time. The psalmist knew the end for the wicked, and so claimed that there was no reason to be envious of them or to fear them. The psalmist moreover claimed that the mockery and the ridicule he received for being righteous was not something to be ashamed of, but something to be proud of. This was because God will repay him right on. Third point, the psalmist sang that he will praise God with a new song. Psalm 96 praises the coming Messiah. It starts with, sing to the Lord a new song. The psalmist sang that God not only created the universe, but also made new things happen in it. Among the 150 psalms, psalms which started like this is Psalms 98 and 149. The content of Psalms 96 is similar to the content of 1 Chronicles chapter 16, which records David's poem. Psalms 97, like 96, goes on about the coming of the Messiah. The main characteristic of God's rule is justice. The psalmist praises God's justice and sings of the righteous trial. 
Psalm 98 follows on to sing of the coming Messiah. He confesses that God is worthy of praise and worship. Psalms 96, 97, and 98 all have similar themes. All three focus on praise, and all three praise God who governs the whole world. Psalm 98 uses all sorts of instruments to praise God. But what stands out more is the message that God is our Savior. This later connects to Jesus as the Savior of the world. Psalm 99 also sings about the coming of the Messiah. The psalmist claims that the Messiah is worthy beyond all aims and should be praised. Fourth point, David sang of God's wonders and righteousness. Psalm 101 was written by David, and here David confesses that he will hate the actors of the renegades. This was the way in which David managed to focus on God and help the people to also focus on God. Psalm 101 contains David's song about how a king should act in a just and righteous way. He confesses that God makes him strong. David claims that he wishes for his life to be like the one who looks to and obeys God at all times. He confesses this through prayer. As a king of a country, he stood before God and proclaimed that he wished to be righteous in God's eyes and that he wished for his people to do so as well. Fifth point, the psalmist asked God not to conceal himself in his days of despair. It is assumed that Psalm 102 was written during the time in Babylon as captives. It records the heart of the distress and the suffering. It is not the prayer of a single person, but represents the prayer of the community. The psalmist writes in a state of agony. He writes, For my days vanish like smoke, my bones burn, like glowing embers, my heart is blighted and withered like grass. I forget to eat my food. In my distress, I groan aloud and am reduced to skin and bones. I lie awake. I have become like a bird, alone on a roof. For I eat ashes as my food and mingle my drink with tears. My days are like the evening shadow. I wither away like grass. Despite his agony, the psalmist starts the prayer, believing that God will hear it. The fact that he prayed in a time of distress shows how he did not lose hope in God. The psalmist waits for God's mercy and blessing. He prays that there will be God's miracle in the midst of a deep despair. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of the Babylonians, for their guilt, declares the Lord, and will make it desolate forever. I will bring on that land all the things I have spoken against it, all that are written in this book, and prophesied by Jeremiah against all the nations. Day 153, Psalms 103 to 106. Praise God, my soul, for the psalmist who knew the wonderful love extended to the man who fears God, praising God was most certainly his first priority. First point, David ordered his own soul to praise God. Psalm 103 was written by David. 
David, who was used to giving commands as king, commanded his own spirit to praise the Lord. He commanded his spirit to look to God, because he knew that the reason humans were created was in order to praise God. The God that David experienced was merciful and remembered his people. Although humans are weak and limited, we can always turn to the Almighty God, our Creator. In order to praise God, we can live the way David did, by knowing about God. We can make reference to other parts in the Bible as we read David's psalm. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge Him. We can also refer to St. John's Confession. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Second point. David confessed that God has mercy for those who have a sympathy for the weak. The expression of all used in Psalm 103 contains a very important meaning. It shows how we as creations fear and are in awe of God the Creator. Someone who is in awe of God always remembers Him and has Him in one's conscience. This is why and how we can focus on the heart of God and always be prepared to follow where He guides us. Someone who follows in God can always live a full life as well as guiding such a life to their descendants. Third point, the psalmist confessed that he will sing of God's praises forever. It has been assumed that the author of Psalms 103 and 104 is David, judging from the psalmist commanding their soul to praise God. The psalmist praises God for the creation of the world. As long as we remember that God is the Creator, humans can always live a humble life. We as creations should live by praising God. As the psalmist confesses, God's creation is full of wisdom. The reason humans can live on this earth is because God laid the grounds for us. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. So long as we remember this, we cannot become arrogant. After creating the world, God has never turned his eyes away from it. God feeds all his creation and has our lives in his hands. Fourth point, the psalm is the song of God who remembers his promise to the thousand generation. Psalm 105 praises God for all the things God has done for Israel. Psalms 78, 106, and 136 all remember how God delivered the Israelites from the hands of Egypt and into the desert. The psalmist thanks God and praises Him. God made a covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and Jacob, and kept this with their descendants. Abraham, who believed in God's covenant, is indeed admirable. Thus, God called Abraham his friend, but you, Israel, my servant. Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. God carried out countless miracles for Abraham's descendants. The reason God chose Israel was for them to keep his laws. The psalmist thanks God and also boasts his name. God's blessing has continued ever since. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping His covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love Him and keep His commandments. This blessing started with Abraham 
was continued by Jesus and is with us today. Fifth point, the psalmist sang that God's grace is everlasting. Psalm 106 is called a hallelujah song, and it praises God with a singing heart. Similar content can be found in Psalms 113, 135, 146 through to 150. The psalmist sings to God who kept his promise with the Israelites by leading them into the promised land. The psalmist recounts the history. We have sinned even as our ancestors did. We have done wrong and acted wickedly. The psalmist thanks God for his everlasting mercy and forgiveness and for the history of Israel. Although he heard the complaining of the Israelites in front of the Red Sea, he still granted them blessing and saved them. Even when they made idols and served other gods, God still had mercy on them. We too can live a life looking to him or shifting away from him. This is really down to earth. The Israelites experienced God's miracles in the desert. However, it did not take them long to forget God's grace, which led them to make idols and do other unthinkable things. But they soon forgot what he had done and did not wait for his plan to unfold. In the desert, they gave in to their craving. In the wilderness, they put God to the test. So he gave them what they asked for, but sent a wasting disease among them. Despite so, God still sent manna to them all throughout their stay in the desert and let them live. Day 154, Psalms 107 to 118. David who praised the Messiah in the faith that God the Father is at his right hand, the psalmist trusted only God while pouring out all his sorrow and grief without feeling ashamed. First point, David sang that he would awaken the dawn. In Psalm 180, David confessed that the reason he stood upright was because of God's right hand, always helping him. My heart, O God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will pray to you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Psalm 180 verses 1 to 5 is similar to Psalm 57 verses 7 to 11 and Psalm 108 Verses 6 to 13 is similar to Psalm 60, verses 5 to 12. They all seek God's salvation and furthermore sing God's praises. David was completely sure that he could get through anything with the courage that God gave him. David said a similar prayer when he met Saul in the cave in Psalm 108. David was able to do so because he wanted God to receive all the glory in the world. In Psalm 108, David sings to God, who not only governs Israel, but the whole world. God is not only for Israel. His mercy extends everywhere. And so David sang that he will awaken the dawn. He wanted his dream to glorify God. Second point, David confessed that all he was able to do was pray. 
in Psalm 109, David praises God who will curse the wicked and bless and save the righteous. David was able to confess this during times of despair. The theme of looking to God while being distressed from the wicked can also be seen in Psalms 58, 109, and 137. While they curse, may you bless, may those who attack me be put to shame, but may your servant rejoice. May my accusers be clothed with disgrace and wrapped in shame and in a cloak. The relationship with God is the most important thing during prayer. We must have a poor heart that focuses on God during prayer. David was surrounded by those who repaid help. With hate and evil, he was most distressed because of these people. All he was able to do was pray to God. It was only God who could repay and judge their evil. And so David poured out his heart and soul to God for him to hear his pains. Help me, Lord my God. Save me according to your unfailing love. Let them know that it is your hand that you, Lord, have done it. David saw God's right hand which did justice. David experienced God's strength when he fought against Goliath. Because of this, David was always able to trust and turn to God. Third point, David sang of the Messiah who was to come as king. Psalm 110 was also written by David. The New Testament makes a reference to this the most out of all the Psalms. The Lord referred to in Psalm 110 was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ would come as the Messiah. The Messiah sits on the right hand throne of God and is the righteous judge. The Messiah also sits on Mount Zion and wears holy clothes to serve the people. The Messiah will come as the high priest. The Messiah will come as the judge. Psalm 110 writes of the rule of the Messiah. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, Why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. Later in the New Testament, Peter also used this psalm. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Paul also referred to this psalm, he exulted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age but also in the one to come. And this psalm was reported to again in the book of Hebrews. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Fourth point, the psalmist sings hallelujah to God's name. Psalm 113 sings hallelujah to God. God protects the weak, feeds the hungry, and also makes barren women bear children. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servant. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore.
from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. The scale which the psalmist shows is incredible in Psalm 113. He speaks of praising God's name forever from sunrise to sunset. God is higher than the heavens, but this Almighty God looks out for all people on earth. He moreover makes sure that justice is served and no one is falsely accused. Who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He sits them with the princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of her children. Praise the Lord. Fifth point. The psalmist confessed that God is his power. Psalm 118 sings praise to God. The psalmist sings praise to God for saving the people and also God's great ability that has protected them. The psalmist sings to God who saved him and also took him away from his suffering. He makes a reference to God saving the Israelites from Egypt. The psalmist expresses and thanks to God who saved those who were hopeless. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Jesus makes direct reference to this. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Apostles also reported to this later, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Day 155, Psalms 119 More insight, more understanding. The Lord's word will be a lamp for their feet and right on their way for those who give their word that they will desire the Lord's decrees, commands and laws and live according to his teachings. First point. The psalmist used various examples to express who God is. Psalm 119 is the longest in all the psalms. Although the author is unknown, many believe that it was written by Ezra. Psalm 119 focuses on God's laws, regulations, commandments, rights, and promise. It stresses God's ways. It also stresses God's precepts. Next, it stresses God's decrees. It then stresses God's commandments. Next, it stresses God's righteous laws. It stresses God's words. It stresses God's laws. It teaches to use God's laws as a discipline. It also teaches that God's words are statutes. The psalmist teaches readers to be glad in God's laws, learn about it and learn to obey and continuously meditate on it. Second point, the psalmist said that he meditates on God's laws all day long. The song of the psalmist contains his deep heart of love towards God. He writes that he thinks about God's love all day long. He wrote, Oh, how I love you all. I meditate on it all day long. The strength of God's words is indeed incredible. If one meditates on God's words, like this psalmist, 
they too will be able to confess the same thing. The older people are respected for their wisdom about life. But the psalmist claimed that anyone who meditates on God's law is wiser than the older. This is because reading, learning, and meditating on God's words is the key to wisdom. Third point, the psalmist confessed that God's laws are like a lamp on his way. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. As the night grows darker, it is instinct to want to see light. This is because light shines away fear and the cold. The psalmist writes that no matter what distress one finds themselves in, they can always find safety in God's words. God finds those who are full of darkness. The psalmist asks God for help on his way. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and punt, longing for your commands. Turn to me and have mercy on me, as you always do to those who love your name. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin roll over me. He confesses that he finds love and strength in God's word. Fourth point, the psalmist confessed that he murmurs God's laws all day long. The psalmist expresses his love towards God as such. My soul faints with the longing for your salvation, but I have put my hope in your word. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. I open my mouth and pant, longing for your commands. My eyes stay up through the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promises. The psalmist confesses that humans are evil and so they need God to save them. The psalmist turns to God during his suffering and earnestly calls for him. Your compassion, Lord, is great. Preserve my life according to your laws. Many are the foes who persecute me, but I have not turned from your statutes. I look on the faceless with loathing, for they do not obey your words. See how I love your precepts. Preserve my life, Lord, in accordance with your love. He laments over the people who do not find God or know about God's laws. He prays for these people and also for himself. During despair and distress, he looks at only God. He shows unmost faith in God. Fifth point, the psalmist sings of the perfection of the Bible. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. The psalmist praises the perfection of the Bible. This is also written in Proverbs. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Paul says this to Timothy, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. In Psalm 119, the writer reflects deeply on God's words, laws, decrees, and commandments. He writes that he will not forget God's decrees. I have strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servants, for I have not forgotten your commands. Day 156, Psalms 120 to 134. Blessings to your family. God blesses those who gladly climb the steps toward his temple to offer praise, and it is a joy to be his associate. First point, the psalmist confesses that he seeks help from God who built the universe. Psalm 121 was written to sing praise as the psalmist went up to the temple. 
I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The psalmist claims that God protects us at all times and helps us when our hearts are wavering. The psalmist looks towards Mount Zion, where the temple is, and reminisces about all the times God was with him during his life. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade and your right hand. The psalmist proclaimed that God gives us strength and protection. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. God does not sleep or fate, and he is with those who rely on him, both during the day and the night. We are consoled from God's strength and power. Second point, David confessed that he is overjoyed when people go to God's house with him. Psalm 122 was written by David, and it was appropriate to sing this during the three annual festivals. The Israelite men were expected to stand before God three times a year. During the three annual festivals, those who kept this were able to experience joy. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to pray the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. David claims that those who seek God and stand before his presence are blessed. I rejoiced with those who said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. David said that those who meet with God can overcome their despair and find joy in praising him. Praise and worship brings us closer to God. Third point, Solomon confessed that if God does not build the house, then the labor of builders is in vain. Psalm 127 was written by Solomon, and it is called his wisdom poem. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the goddess stand watch in vain. Solomon was someone who built many buildings in his lifetime. He built the temple for seven years and also his palace for 13 years. He put a great deal of effort into these projects. Solomon confessed that he could not do anything without God. Christians are those who ask God before doing something. We could be the ones who stuck the bricks, but the one who makes the house is God. Solomon was able to confess this. Passing on your faith to the next generation is the best thing we can do. David was able to do this to Solomon. David made the preparations for the temple, but the one to actually make it was Solomon. David and Solomon implemented their dream together. They both had in their hearts to glorify God. Fourth point, the psalmist sings that God blesses the families who obey God. Psalm 128 is a wisdom poem. The people who walk towards God is blessed, and God looks favorably upon these people. The blessings mentioned by God in this psalm were you will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you live to see your children's children. Peace be on Israel. As such, God promised such blessings for those who obeyed and turned to God. Fifth point, the psalmist asks God to remember the promise he made with David. Psalm 132 praises the descendants of David. The psalmist lists the actions of David and blesses his descendants. 
The psalmist prays to God to remember the covenant he made with David and to fulfill his promise. David adored and valued God's ark, and God looked favorably on him for this. Thus, the psalmist put David in his prayer. As such, Psalm 132 reflects on the fulfillment of God's covenant with David and the coming of the Messiah. Day 157 Psalms 135 to 142 God's right hand holds me. Since God watches, thoughts, and actions of all people, we should fall down before Him and ask Him to put His goddess on our lips. First point, the psalmist hopes that people will commemorate God for generations to come. Psalms 78, 105, and 106 are historical poems along with Psalms 135, which proclaims that God saved Israel despite the Israelites worshipping other idols. The reason to praise and worship God lies here. God selected the Israel people to be his possession and led them out of Egypt. God also gave the land of Canaan, as he had promised to their ancestors. God is incomparable to any lowly idols made by humans. The fact that God protected the Israelites was God's great blessing. Subjectively seen, the Israelites were not outstanding compared to other nations. However, God selected them to carry out his mission. The psalmist teaches people to praise God and emphasizes that God is worthy of our worship. Second point, David confesses that even though God is a high above, he still helps the weak. In Psalm 138, David offers thanks to God. David thanks God for listening to his prayer. He also confessed that he knew that God would deliver him from any hardship or fear. David could have made himself a great military king with his army. However, David wished to be known for serving God and to become God's army. In this psalm, David offers his thanks to God for his help in raising his spirit and for God's right hand. Third point, David thinks that God does not forget a single thing that he said. In Psalm 139, David writes that he is being chased and that his life is in danger. He asks that he will hate those who hate God. David pulls himself together by confessing that God's will cannot be changed. Before we knew God, God knew us. God knows everything about us, our thoughts, actions, fears, etc. The most wonderful thing is that God looks after us with his right hand. This realization consoled David enormously. Thus, David confessed that the Lord was his shepherd and that he lacked nothing because of this. God knows where I sit and stand up. God knows my thoughts. God knows my every move. God knows the words that come out from my tongue. God knew me before I was born. God knows my heart and my intentions. Therefore, we cannot escape God. David walked with God all throughout his life. Faith starts from realizing this. Fourth point, David thinks that God is his Lord. In Psalm 140, David cried that there was no person to save him from Saul while he was being chased. And so David asked God to judge the wicked. 
instead of attacking his enemies, David instead waited for God to strike. He had the faith that God would not let the wicked get away with their deed. God knew David's suffering, and he had the faith that God would act on his behalf. David was thus able to rely on God. David wrote, Rescue me, Lord, from evil to us. Protect me from the violent. They make their tongues as sharp as a serpent. The poison of vipers is on their ribs. Keep me safe, Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Protect me from the violent, who devise ways to trim my feet. The arrogant have hidden a snare for me. They have spread out the cords of their net and have set traps for me along my path. David looked to God and asked for his help. This is the privilege for those who have faith. They know and believe that God is there to help. Fifth point. David sang for his prayer to be like burnt incense before God. In Psalm 141, David does not attack his enemies, but rather calls out to God. He was able to do this because he believed and trusted in God's righteousness. Later on, David asked God to send a God over his mouth so that he would not say wrong things. David prayed most earnestly. David wanted his prayer to burn like incense before God. David was someone who made burnt offerings to God with animals. With his experience, he wished for his prayer to burn like incense and be a pleasing aroma to the Lord. David prayed for his prayer to be like an offering. He prayed that his heart did not waver due to the wicked. He also prayed that he accepted the harsh words that criticized him. He prayed that he escaped to God and for God to rescue him from the wicked. David always prayed that, May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be praising in your sight, Lord my Lord and my Redeemer. Thus, God called David someone who was close to his heart. This was why David was able to keep his heart concentrated on God despite having to rule a kingdom at war for most of Israel. We should also hope to pray like David for God to say that we are close to his heart. Day 158, Psalms 143 to 150. David, a man of true faith. We praise God who is king, whose love is eternal and infinite, and who draws near to all who seek him. Hallelujah. First point, David yearned for God and prayed that his spirit adore him. In Psalm 143, David turned to God when he felt extremely lost and confused. David found hope in God each time he felt distressed and remembered each time to praise God. At the time David wrote this, his soul was as down as it could be. He expressed that he felt as though his enemies had seized him long ago. He expressed that his soul was as tired and downcast as it could be. Therefore, David started to think about the times God was with him in the past. For example, when he was fighting against the lion and the bear and also against the Goliath. God does not only listen to people's praise, but he also listens to their cry. So David cried out to God for help during his time of despair. Second point, David thanked God for loving him. Psalm 144 was written by David, and he praised God for victory, even before heading out for battle. 
This is because David had faith that God looks after his children, and that God would make sure that they prosper. David, who was used to fighting, prayed to God. He confessed that God taught him what to do, and that God gave him strength. He moreover confessed that God taught him everything about battles, and that all glory was for God. From the whole Bible, David was an outstanding king who led his country into countries' victories. He always turned to God and also marveled at His work. Lord, what are human beings that you care for them, mere mortals that you think of them? David was able to truly confess this and worship God for His grace. Third point. David praises God, who is his king. Psalm 145 was David's worship poem. Here, David claims that all who turn to him will receive his blessing. And rather than referring to himself as king, he emphasized that God was the ultimate king. He wanted to raise God's name above high. I will exalt to you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Psalm 145 is the only psalm that is reported to as David's psalm of praise. David wrote many psalms, but Psalm 145 is particularly sung the most as a hymn. Here, David confesses that he praises God five times. He forever sings of God's praises. If David only remembered the suffering he went through in his youth, he would not have been able to remember God as such. But David never failed to remember God. All throughout his suffering, he always turned to God. David remembered how God protected him and the song of his wonders. Fourth point, the psalmist thinks that praising God is the most beautiful thing humans can do. In Psalm 147, the psalmist praises God for looking after the whole world and for particularly taking care of Israel. Above all, the psalmist thanks God for giving them his laws and decrees. He has revealed his word to Jacob, his laws and decrees to Israel. He has done this for no other nation. They do not know his laws. The psalmist emphasizes the joy in praising God and the country's reasons one should praise God. He particularly thinks towards Mount Zion and the Temple of Jerusalem. This is because God raised it and dwells in it. Fifth point, the psalmist tells all those with life to praise God. In Psalm 150, the psalmist commands all those who have life to praise God. He shouts that God is the owner of time and space and all lives. Therefore, all who have life should praise God, because it is God who gave us life. In Psalm 150, many instruments are used. Instruments and voices are used to praise God. But the most important thing above all is the heart to rejoice God. Stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? The people I formed for myself that they may proclaim my praise. Day 159, 1 Kings 12 to 14. Division into south and north for 200 years. The south and north Israel that became divided gradually shifted farther away from their original shape of serving God, and Jeroboam became 
a pronoun of evil kings. First point. Two years after the death of Solomon, Israel became divided for the second time and this lasted for 200 years. During the 200 years, South Judah zigzagged between the way of David and the way of Jeroboam. As for knows Israel, for 200 years they completely neglected a kingdom of priests. The history of North Israel can be summarized in four broad points. The first is that the 19 kings during the 200 years all followed in the way of Jeroboam. The second is that it started with Jeroboam and ended with Hosea with the Omni and Jehu dynasties in between. The third is that during the Omri dynasty, prophets Elijah and Elisha walked, and during the Jehu dynasty, Amos and Hosea walked in order to turn back to David's way. The fourth is that those Israel who only went in the way of Jeroboam for 200 years eventually fell in the hands of Assyria in 8th century BC and thus made them into mixed lace Samaritans. Second point, the initial reason for the division of the country was due to Solomon's later rule, and the actual reason for the division was because of Solomon's son Rehoboam's choice. After the death of Solomon, his son Rehoboam attempted a conversation with the people of Israel at Shechem. The reason Rehoboam went out to the people rather than the people coming to him was in order to get the support of the people in the north, and also because the people in the north had already turned against Rehoboam. Jeroboam, on the other hand, had escaped to Egypt in the days of Solomon. But when Solomon died, Jeroboam became the head of the north. The process of Jeroboam becoming the head involved the following. Firstly, Jeroboam was raised by his widowed mother, and during Solomon's days, he made himself known as an ality in architectural construction. Secondly, during the late years of Solomon's rule, Jeroboam became Solomon's political rival, and there were people who supported Jeroboam. Thirdly, Jeroboam heard through prophet Ahijah that he was to be the king of the ten tribes of Israel. Fourthly, when Jeroboam became popular, he had to run away to Egypt due to threats from Solomon. Fifthly, after returning from Israel, he became the head of the people in the north. As such, the people's hearts were going towards Jeroboam, but Rehoboam, who was 41 years old at the time, decided to listen to his friends rather than the advice given by the elders. Because of Rehoboam's foolish decision, within three days, the people turned against him. Third point, Jeroboam became the king of the ten tribes according to the request of the Israelites. Previously, Jeroboam had heard through the prophet Ahijah of God's decision. About that time, Jeroboam was going out of Jerusalem. And Ahijah, the prophet of Shiloh, met him on the way, wearing a new cloak. The two of them were alone out in the country, and Ahijah took a hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into twelve pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, Take ten pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord that God of Israel says, See, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give you ten tribes. 
that God has said, Jeroboam became the king of North Israel that consisted of ten tribes. Fourth point, through prophet Shemaiah, God blocked the war between the south and north. When the ten tribes appointed Jeroboam as their king, Rehoboam, who was on his way from Shechem, prepared for war in order to retrieve the ten tribes back. At this, prophet Shemaiah intervened and stopped this war. Thankfully, Rehoboam obeyed God in this. God did not want brother countries to fight each other. Although they were divided into two, God still wanted them to implement a kingdom of priests. God told Jeroboam that he would be given the ten tribes, who would be much stronger than South Judah, to acknowledge Jerusalem and to make sure not to weaken the system of a kingdom of priests. God, furthermore, told him not to intermarry with foreign princesses and to maintain a good relationship with their brother country, South Judah. Fifth point, Jeroboam used a kingdom of priests as his tool to create the way of Jeroboam. God gave Jeroboam ten tribes on the condition that he was to follow in David's way and to strengthen a kingdom of priests. However, Jeroboam feared that if the people of North Israel went to Jerusalem three times a year to keep the annual festivals, their hearts may waver towards Rehoboam. And so he made a new way which was Jeroboam's way. To secure his own political stability and power, he used a kingdom of priests as his tool. Here we can compare David's way and Jeroboam's way. To look at David's way, which focused on strengthening a kingdom of priests, the first was that it centered on God's forgiveness. The second was that it focused on sharing between neighbors. The third was that it focused on peace between nations. Oppositely, Jeroboam's way firstly selected those who were not from the tribe of Levi as priests. Secondly, the place of worship was changed, as well as the target of worship that became man-made idols rather than God. Thirdly, the timings of festivals were changed. The first festival in a kingdom of priests was Passover, which was dedicated to remembering the day the Israelites came out from Egypt. But Jeroboam changed this. Another huge mistake of Jeroboam was that during his fifth year of rule, he ignored the fact that the Egyptian king was attacking the Jerusalem temple. In other words, he did not care that his brother nation was in trouble. This was most likely because Jeroboam had received help from the Egyptian king during his exile away from Solomon. Day 160, 1 Kings chapter 15 to chapter 16, verse 20. Jeroboam's way in five points. As history progressed, the evil of kings of Israel continued, but God did not give up on Israel that was mired in sin. First point, Jeroboam, the first king of North Israel, made five big mistakes during his 22 years as king and thus made the way of Jeroboam. Jeroboam, who was anointed by God, to rule over the ten tribes of Israel, most unfortunately was like a soul who could not keep to God's ways. He ended up making the most disastrous way for the next 22 years. He firstly ignored God's command to maintain peace with South Judah, which meant that there was war between the two countries for 22 years. 
He secondly completely changed the three festivals of the kingdom of priests in order to stop the people of North Israel going to Jerusalem. He thirdly appointed other people, meaning non-Levites, as priests. He fourthly ignored Jerusalem when it was attacked. He then lastly changed the places of offering to Dan and Bethel. The next kings of North Israel followed in the way of Jeroboam for the next 200 years. Second point. During the reign of Solomon's grandson Abijah, South Judah continued their wars with North Israel for three years. Abijah became the next king, following Rehoboam in South Judah, and he reigned for three years. Unfortunately, he did not follow God's laws. David's grandson Rehoboam and David's great-grandson Abijah both left God to worship idols. Indeed, Abijah was unable to follow in David's footsteps. All throughout his three years in power, battles with North Israel did not come to a cross. Abijah took 400,000 soldiers against Jeroboam's 800,000, and he managed to kill 500,000 of Jeroboam's soldiers. He furthermore managed to seize the castle of North Israel in Bethel. For three years, Abijah did not follow in the way of David, but because of the covenant God made with David, God allowed him to rule. Third point, Asa, the third king of South Judah, tried to make the people return to God. Next to rule South Judah after Abijah was Asa. Among the 20 kings of South Judah, Asa was one of the four who tried to turn his people to God. Besides him, there was also Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, and Josiah. Unfortunately, Asa failed to completely destroy the temples for idol worship. In terms of North Israel, Jeroboam's son Nadab was killed by Baasha, and Jeroboam's monarchy came to a cross. Baasha collaborated with Aram in order to attack South Judah and furthermore fortified Lama to prevent anyone from leaving or entering the territory of Asa, king of Judah. Asa, therefore, took all the silver and gold that was left in the treasuries of the Lord's temple and gave it as a tribute to the king of Aram to take back Lama. Kings of Israel, as such, cared more about their own well-being and power that they neglected a kingdom of priests which made the people suffer all the more. Fourth point, the second king of North Israel, Ladab, the third king, Baasha, and the fourth king, Elah, all went in the way of Jeroboam. Nadab, who took after his father Jeroboam's throne as the second king of North Israel, followed directly in the way of his father. Some time later, Nadab was killed by Baasha, which ultimately ended the monarchy of Jeroboam's household and introduced a new monarchy. However, the third and fourth kings of North Israel also followed in the way of Jeroboam. God therefore sent his prophet Jehu to deliver his judgment. Fifth point. The fifth king of North Israel, Zimni, only reigned for seven days. Zimni killed Elah and became the fifth king of North Israel. Zimni, however, reigned as a king for only seven days. This was because the people of North Israel did not accept him as a king, but rather preferred Omni as their king. When Zimni found out that the people appointed Omni instead of him, he ended his own life. Day 161, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 21 to chapter 17. 
three year preparation for the battle at Mount Carmel. The theme of North Israel that continued from Omni to his son Ahab became deeper, and God prepared and sent Elijah, who was a man of God. First point. North Israel saw a series of coup d'etat. With the start of Omni's monarchy, Omni made Samaria into the new capital and stabilized military power. Omni, furthermore, brought in a princess from Sidon called Jezebel as wife for his son Ahab. But this offered an age of complete idol worship for North Israel. With a heavy heart, God sent the prophet Elijah to North Israel. Whenever God sent a prophet, this was not because all was going well, but because things were going really badly. Elijah's work focused on not turning the people to God, but making them choose between God and the Baals. Because of this, God did not send rain to North Israel for many years. Second point, Omni, the king of North Israel, abused his power more than Jeroboam. When news broke out that Zimni was preparing for a coup d'etat, the people instead divided between Omni and Timni. Omni therefore had to carry out internal war with the supporters of Timni, and eventually became the sixth king of North Israel. Omni ruled in Tijra like the previous kings for six years and then moved the capital to Samaria, where he built a new palace. But the way he purchased that land of Samaria went against the laws of the kingdom of priests. Omni tried even harder than the previous kings to follow in the way of Jeroboam. He did evil by making Omni laws. Third point, Ahab, who took after Omni, opened the ultimate age of idol worship. Ahab was the next king of the Omni dynasty, and he ruled North Israel for 22 years. He did just as much or even more evil than his father, that he was named the worst king out of the 19 kings of North Israel. His wife Jezebel had a lot to do with this. Ahab, along with his wife Jezebel, made the new capital Samaria full of the temple of Baals and Asherah, and made the country the worst it had ever been since Jeroboam. North Israel went as far as to rebuild the castle of Jericho, which was destroyed by Joshua and was one not to be rebuilt. First point, the prophet Elijah befriended the ravens and prepared for Mount Carmel for three years. Baal and Asherah, which Jezebel brought fully into North Israel, were supposedly meant to help with the growth of crops and also make rain come. The people of North Israel wanted the crops to grow and the rain to come for their abundance, so they strayed away from God. Because of this, God sent the prophet Elijah to announce that there would be a drought. Elijah warned the people of this by telling them of the warning in Leviticus 26 verses 2 to 4 and Deuteronomy 11 verses 16 to 17. God did not send rain to North Israel for over three years. Elijah had to eat food brought from a raven and prepare for the debate on Mount Carmel. Fifth point, Elijah and the widow of Jarafath were able to experience God's miracles through their obedience. During the three years in hiding, God sent to Elijah a raven and also a foreign woman. The land of Sidon was where the Baal worshippers flourished and also where Jezebel was from. 
Zarephath was a place between Sidon and Tyre. But God had made Elijah hide from Ahab and Jezebel in Sidon. The widow at Zarephath was able to learn about God through Elijah, and thus witnessed the great miracle of Andrew's food supplies. She experienced another miracle following the first. God saved her son from death. Day 162, 1 Kings 18-19 The Secret Behind the Battle on Mount Carmel Although North Israel witnessed that God was alive on Mount Carmel, foolishly they did not turn to God. First point, when drought continued in North Israel for three years, Elijah and Ahab had a debate. When the drought in North Israel continued for three years, Ahab went with his servant Obadiah to find some water. Obadiah was in charge of the palace and was Ahab's servant, but from his youth, Obadiah had obeyed God and secretly hid a hundred prophets from Jezebel. Whilst Ahab was on the hunt for some water with Obadiah, Elijah told through Obadiah that he wished to meet with Ahab. Through Obadiah, Ahab and Elijah were able to meet, and immediately they started a debate. The topic of the debate was that the reason of the drought was because of the other party. Ahab claimed that the drought was because of Elijah, and Elijah claimed that the drought was because of the sins of him and his father. Their debate led to the debate on Mount Carmel. Elijah proposed that Ahab bring his people as witnesses and that the God who sent down fire would be the ultimate God. The reason Elijah mentioned the 450 Baal prophets and the 400 Asherah prophets was to show just how bad idol worship had become in North Israel. Second point, Elijah proposed the first battle on Mount Carmel by using the method of Aaron's first offering. The method proposed by Elijah was that each brought a cup and that they waited for fire to burn it. The first offering to be burnt would show who the real God was. Miracles were used by God through prophets as a last resort to show the people when they really did not care to believe or listen. The first part of the battle at Mount Carmel saw the prophets of the Baals being knocked down. For the second part of the battle, the prayer of Elijah started. The method Elijah proposed traced back to Aaron's first offering with God's fire consuming the offering. Of course, no fire came from Baal and Asherah. And as for Elijah, God sent a fire which not only burnt the offering but also burnt all the water that had been purposely poured. All those who were present bowed down in shock. The people started to say, Elijah, Elijah. At that moment, Elijah made the people kill the 450 prophets of the Baals. Elijah moreover prayed to God for the drought to come to an end. Third point, Jezebel sent assassins to attack Elijah. When Jezebel found out about the results on Mount Carmel and that the 450 prophets of the Baals she sent were killed, she publicly announced the killing of Elijah and sent assassins. When Elijah heard this, he turned back from his way to Samaria 
and had to run away from the assassins. He reached Yeshiva and as he rested, he asked God to end his life. The reason Elijah wished for death was because Jezebel had not even flinched at the results on Mount Carmel. But God sent an angel to Elijah and gave him new strength. Fourth point, Moses had to run away from Pharaoh and Elijah had to run away from the assassins of Jezebel. God lifted Elijah and made him travel the desert for 40 days in order to escape from Jezebel's assassins. And then God met with Elijah on Mount Horeb. God met with many others in the Bible. To list a few examples, God met with Moses. He also met with the Israelites on Mount Sinai. God also met with Moses on Mount Sinai. God also spoke to Jesus when he was being baptized. God also met with Saint John in Patmos. Fifth point, Elijah along with Elisha and 7,000 others were given the mission of a kingdom of priests on Mount Horeb. Elijah shouted to God on Mount Horeb that he was the only one left. So God told him that there were seven thousands of God's people left, as well as Elisha to carry on God's work. God did not give up on the people and continuously sent them prophets. God planned a new generation through Hosea, Jehu, and Elisha. This is closed by Elijah passing on his ministry to Elisha. Day 163, 1 Kings 20-22 Jezebel, the follower of Baal, of using the rose to murder Naboth. Ahab, who made it a lure to the evil, such as taking Naboth's vineyard by force, was killed in the battle with Aram, as prophesied by Micaiah. First point, Ahab failed to realize that it was God who helped them win against Aram. At the time, Benadad, king of Aram, mustered his army accompanied by 32 kings, their horses and chariots, and they went to besiege Samaria. When Ahab tried to strengthen his army, through relations with Sidon and Tyre, ben tried to stop this. His father, ben the I, had made a treaty between Aram and North Israel. But due to the request of South Judah's King Asa, the treaty with North Israel was broken, and they attacked North Israel instead. Therefore, the people inside Samaria devised various plans. The elders of North Israel, as well as the people, all claimed that they would not listen to the request or what conditions of Ben-Hadad. ben therefore claimed that he would seize Samaria, break their walls, and make the people inside Samaria fear. At this, Ahab decided to proactively respond rather than surrender. When ben Haddad heard this, he ordered for the attack to begin. So the battle began, but God sent a prophet to tell them that those Israel would win this war. With God's help, those Israel was able to win with their seven thousands against the hundred thousands of Aram. Aram attacked again the following year, but with God's help once more, North Israel was victorious. Overnight, Aram lost 100,000 soldiers, and the remaining 27,000 also died, similarly to when Jericho collapsed. But when the war ended, Ahab met with ben and saved him. In exchange for saving his life, 
I have made Benadad return the castles of North Israel that he had taken and also made a deal on trade. God's command was to kill Benadad, but Ahab did not listen and instead made a treaty with him. Second point, Jezebel framed Naboth, who kept the rose regarding land in a kingdom of priests, and then killed him. After winning the war against Aram through God's help, instead of strengthening a kingdom of priests, Ahab instead killed Naboth, who tried his best to keep the laws of a kingdom of priests. Jezebel was a worshiper of the Baal, so she abused the laws of a kingdom of priests and killed Naboth. This concerned Naboth's vineyard. Through the instant of Naboth's vineyard, we can see just how perverted and terrible this age was. The legal procedures concerning Naboth's vineyard was as follows. First, Ahab coveted Naboth's vineyard, but this was illegal according to the laws of a kingdom of priests. Second, as Naboth followed in God's laws, he rejected the king's offer. Third, in order to take the vineyard, Jezebel started to scheme and falsely accused him. Fourth, her method was to buy the judges, such as village elders and the royals. Fifth, she hired two men to make false accusations. This was to abuse the laws and then provide a reason to kill. Such laws existed back in Leviticus. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is to be put to death. The entire assembly must stone them. Whether foreigner or native born, when they blaspheme the name, they are to be put to death. Six, she made the judge put Naboth to death and make the vineyard her property. And in order to make sure no one would claim it, she killed Naboth's descendants. Third point, Ezekiel sent the prophet Nathan to David after the instant of Uriah. God sent the prophet Elijah to Ahab after the instant of Naboth. When David wrongly killed Uriah, God clearly told him how he would be punished. To Ahab, who wrongly killed Naboth, God sent the prophet Elijah to tell him the following. First, God told him of his faults and said that he would be punished. Second, God also proclaimed punishment upon Zezbel. When Ahab heard this, for a brief while, he repented before God. When God saw this, he was pleased. Have you noticed how Ab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. Ahab was the worst king out of all the kings of North Israel. But when he repented to God, God was pleased and deferred the punishment. As such, God wants to forgive humans more than we can ever know. Fourth point, Ahab died from getting hit by a mistaken arrow whilst fighting against Aram. The battle between North Israel and Aram resumed. North Israel was the first to attack this time. The reason they attacked was because Benadad had not kept to his side of the treaty. So North Israel made a treaty with South Judah and started a war with Aram. Before the war, South Judah's king Jehoshaphat proposed to Ahab to first ask God what they were to do. And so Ahab asked 400 prophets to ask God of his will. But here, Zedekiah and most of the prophets gave a false report. Disregarding God's will, they reported that Ahab would win. And so Ahab gained confidence from his treat with Jehoshaphat and the report from his 400 prophets and prepared for war. But the prophet Micaiah 
proclaimed that Ahab should not start this war and that it was against God. However, much like Jeremiah, Micaiah was abused for telling the truth. Interestingly, Ahab must have been slightly nervous because he made Jehoshaphat the leader of the army and he himself dressed like a soldier and went to fight. But coincidentally, an arrow pulled by an armed soldier shot Ahab and killed him. As for Jehoshaphat, God saved him in this fight, and so he was able to leave. But Ahab, as Micaiah and Elijah had forewarned, died during battle. Fifth point, the fourth king of South Judah, Jehoshaphat, followed in the way of David and tried to turn people towards God. The Bible records two evaluations on Jehoshaphat. The positive report was as follows. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of his father David before him. He did not consult the Baals, but sought the gods of his father, and followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. But he also received a negative. Like his father, he did not get rid of the idol temples completely. He also did not ask God about making a treaty with North Israel before doing so. In everything, he followed the ways of his father, Asa, and did not stray from them. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. The high places, however, were not removed. And the people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. He also brought in Ahab's daughter as his daughter-in-law, which opened South Judah for more idol worship. Although Jehoshaphat had such flaws, he was evaluated to have followed in the way of David. Day 164 To Kings 1-2 to Elijah on Mount Carmel While the evil of Ahab's period became greater because of Ahaziah's sinful life and rule, Elijah's ministry was inherited by Elisha. First point, North Israel's monarchy is passed down from Ahab to Ahaziah, and the position of a prophet is also passed down from Elijah to Elisha. What the Bible records regarding Ahaziah's action is that he consulted Baal Jebub, the god of Ekron, to see whether he would recover from an illness. As the whole of North Israel was dripping in idol worship, God sent Elisha to take over Elijah to carry out his ministry. Elijah, who lived passionately for God, was taken up to the heavens and thus ended his life on earth. Although Elijah's ministry was outstandingly done in God's eyes, the result of his hard work did not appear on the surface. It seemed as though nothing would change North Israel, but God still had hope as he sent Elisha full of his spirit. Second point, by predicting the death of Ahab, Elijah once again proclaimed the end of the Omni monarchy. The son of Ahab and Jezebel was Ahaziah, and as the eighth king of North Israel, he went directly in the way of Jeroboam, much like his predecessors. When Elijah heard that Ahaziah went to consult Baal Jebub to ask whether he would recover from his illness, he predicted the death of Ahaziah. The god that Ahaziah served was a god of Ekron, a city in the land of the Philistines, and it was the lord of the flies. Third point, in order to arrest Elijah, Ahaziah sent his army three times. When Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, heard that Elijah had predicted his death, 
he tried to arrest him three times by sending the captain of 50 and his 50 men. But fire came down from heaven and killed them all. When the two captains of 50 and a hundred men died, the third captain of 50 humbly pleaded for his life and delivered the message of the king. So Elijah and the captain went to Ahaziah, and Elijah once again predicted his death. As he predicted, Ahaziah died. His son Joram took over. Fourth point, Elijah, who lived like fire, was taken up to heaven by God. Elijah was deeply associated with the fire. On Mount Carmel, he asked God to send fire. And when the king sent men to arrest him, he prayed to God, and the fire came down to kill them. When God took Elijah to heaven, a fire chariot came to take him. God decided to take Elijah to heaven. When Elisha tried to stick with Elijah, he fooled him away three times. Eventually, because of Elisha, Elijah went to Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, and also Jordan. In the Jordan River, Elijah performs the miracle of splitting the waters. Elisha asked Elijah for him to inherit a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And then Elijah went up to heaven. Like Enoch, Elijah also did not see death, but was taken straight up to heaven by God. Fifth point, Elijah was the runner for the first half, and then Elisha took over the second half. With Elijah taken up to heaven, now it was time for Elisha to take over. Elisha's ministry started with the miracle of turning sour water into drinkable water. The next miracle was the death of 42 children who ridiculed Elisha and the ascent of Elijah. Day 165, 2 Kings 3-5 the meaning behind Elisha's miracles. The backdrop to the miracles carried out by Elisha contained God's sorrowful heart who watched the disciples struggling while evil prospered. First point, Elisha, who took over Elijah, prepared for his ministry. When Ahaziah died, another son of Ahab called Joram took over the monarchy. Joram was different to his incredibly wicked father and his brother, who consulted a fly-related idol. Joram got rid of the country's altars for the Baals and Asherah. Most unfortunately, however, he still followed in the way of Jeroboam. He did not get rid of the idols in Dan and Bethel. It was amidst such circumstances that Elisha went to Mount Carmel and then came down to train and teach the other prophets. Elisha did not have a home or a steady income. On many occasions, he had to feed himself in the wilderness in order to survive. Despite such hardship, Elisha did his best to deliver God's message and also put his all into teaching the prophets about God. Elisha's ministry was brought to surface through the battle between those Israel and Moab. Second point, Jehoshaphat, the king of South Judah, went to find Elisha to ask for help. When Joram became the king of North Israel, Moab attacked. During the days of David, Moab was associated with Israel. But when Ahab died during the battle against Aram, Moab used this as an opportunity to disassociate them with Israel and to gain independence. When Moab raised a flag of opposition towards Israel, and stopped paying tribute, North Israel, South Judah, and Edom all came together to strike Moab. 
King Jehoshaphat of South Judah had previously joined with Ahab from North Israel to fight against Aram, and he also brought in Ahab's daughter as his daughter-in-law. This time, he held hands with Joram to fight against Moab. When Jehoshaphat and Joram came to strike Moab, the prophet Jehu from South Judah came to rebuke them. North Israel, South Judah, and Edom all faced hardship when they could not locate any water on their way to battle. They all did not care to ask God about this before heading out. No water was their punishment for their arrogance. And so Jehoshaphat proposed to the kings of North Israel and Edom to ask help from Elisha. They all went to find Elisha. The reason Elisha met with them was because of Jehoshaphat. Elisha told the three kings where they would find water and also predicted that they would win the war. When the king of Moab saw that the chances of their victory were faint, he killed his eldest son who was to take over his throne by burning him. When the three countries saw this, they stopped the war and returned home. Third point, Elisha's miracle shows just how difficult it was for prophets to minister during those days. In two kings, there are many records of the miracles carried out by Elisha. First, there was the miracle of pouring oil into empty containers. The second was the miracle of a Shunammite woman having a son. The third miracle was the woman's son being restored from death. The fourth was the miracle of turning the poisoned soup into edible food. The fifth miracle was the feeding of a hundred. Fourth point, Naaman from Aram was able to experience God's miracle through Elisha and his men. Naaman, who was a brave soldier in the Aram army, heard that he could be healed from leprosy through a girl who was brought in as a captive. And so Naaman wanted to get help from the king of Aram and to go to North Israel. So the king of Aram sent a letter to North Israel to heal Naaman. But when the king of North Israel read this letter, he tore his robes and misunderstood that he had to be the one to heal. When Elisha heard this, he told him to send Naaman to him. But when Naaman was brought to him, Elisha did not actually meet him. He told Naaman through his servants of the way he can be healed. Naaman was very displeased at Elisha's attitude and said that he would return to Aram with a grudge in his heart. Naaman had expected Elisha to heal him by placing his hand on his leprosy. Thus, he regarded Elisha's method to have been lacking in effort. But due to the advice from his servants, Naaman listened to Elisha's message and was healed from leprosy. When he was healed, he offered thanks to God and repented for worshiping Riman. Fifth point, Lot's wife, Achan and Gehazi failed to read the atmosphere of their times. Gehazi went after Naaman after he was healed and then told a lie in order to receive something from him. Elisha rebuked Gehazi for doing this. He rebuked Gehazi for accepting silver, cloth, and servants. What Gehazi should have done was to focus on God. The Bible records similar people to Gehazi who focused more on materials rather than God. One example is Lot's wife, who turned to a pillar of salt because of her greed. Another example is Achan, who took the goose during the conquering of Ai. Saul is also a case when he saved the king of Amalek in order to keep the materials. 
Judas Iscariot also fits into this list, as he took silver pieces and sold Jesus. Indeed, human greed often leads to sin. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Day 166, 2 Kings 6-8, Elisha's Prophet Shukr. At the moment of a crisis, when Aram surrounded Samaria, God delivered North Israel through wonderful miracles. First point. Elisha set up a school for his student prophets to teach them about a kingdom of priests. Elisha, who took after Elijah, gathered his student prophets in North Israel and tried his best to make sure that God's word was learned. Some of Elisha's students proposed moving to Jordan in order to make more room for study. Elisha said yes to this proposal. However, in the process of cutting down trees in the Jordan, one of them dropped the borrowed iron axe head into the water. At this, Elisha performed the miracle of making the axe head float out of the water. But this miracle was not to stop a simply being impressive. It was important to understand just how poor the people of God in North Israel lived. The prophets of Baal and Asherah at the time lived a plentiful life supported by the people. But God's prophets lived a difficult life. Second point. God granted his miracle to North Israel by saving them from the attack from the Aram army. Aram attacked North Israel and so war broke out between the two countries. Because of Elisha's prediction, Aram lost once again. The king of Aram decided to capture Elisha by sending his soldiers. When Elisha was surrounded by the Aram army, Elisha's servant became afraid, so Elisha showed God's fire chariot to calm him down. Now the Aram soldiers surrounded the Dothan area to capture Elisha, and the chariot of fire surrounded the Aram army. Elisha prayed to God to blind the Aram soldiers. God heard Elisha's prayer and blinded them. Elisha lured the soldiers into the Samaria wars, and instead of killing them, he sent them back after hosting them. Through this instant, Aram learned of God's power, and they were unable to attack North Israel. Third point, Samaria, who grew away from a kingdom of priests, was punished according to the laws written in Leviticus. After some time passed, Aram forgot about the past incident of Naaman and God's grace and once again attacked North Israel. They came for Samaria again. This caused serious inflation inside Samaria. There was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver and a quarter of a cup of seed poured this for five shekels, Israel paid one silver shekel for a laborer's four-day wages. So we can see just how hefty 80 silver shekels for a donkey's head equated to. Such punishment was given to the people of North Israel for their sin of worshipping idols. All this was forewarned in Leviticus. As recorded in Leviticus, the people had to receive their punishment for not following a kingdom of priests. When such misfortune took place in North Israel, the king very foolishly started to blame Elisha and tried to kill him. 
The reason he blamed Elisha was firstly because Elisha had cured Naaman from Aram. Secondly, Elisha had previously warned of Aram's attack, but he did not this time. Thirdly, he blamed Elisha for letting the Aram soldiers go unscathed the last time. Fourth point, through Elisha, God gave Samaria another chance. Through Elisha, God told the people of Samaria that they would recover financially. This predicted the end of the Aram seas. But a general who did not believe Elisha spoke out. In this situation, four people who were suffering from leprosy heard that the Aram soldiers were returning. During the time, the four people with leprosy went to the camp of the Arameans. God caused the soldiers to hear the sound of the chariots and horses and live with fear in their hearts. When the four people with leprosy saw that the camp was empty, they went to report this to the city. When this good news reached the north of Israel, the king checked for himself. This was all according to the words of Elisha. As for the general, who did not believe Elisha, he went out of the city and while trying to maintain order, he died from being trampled by the hungry people. Fifth point, due to Elijah's mission to Elisha, Elisha went to Aram. After the war with Aram, Elisha went to visit Damascus. At the time, Benadad was ill, and so he made Hazael take gifts to Elisha to ask whether he would be able to recover. When Elisha met Hazael, he predicted that Hazael was to be the next king. When Hazael heard this, he killed Benadad and became king. Elijah's prediction that Hazael would become king came true in the days of Elisha. Day 167, 2 Kings 9-10 to Jehu's first and second religious reformations Jehu, who was anointed by a prophet disciple sent by Elisha, soon destroyed Ahab's household and arranged a turning point in history. First point, through the student of Elisha, Jehu becomes anointed as king over North Israel. The prophet student of Elisha anointed Jehu as the tenth king of North Israel. This was a fulfillment of God's word through Elisha that Jehu would become king. The reason Jehu became anointed as king through Elisha's students was God's punishment towards the house of Ahab, who worshipped Baal and Asherah. Jezebel used the tax money to worship Baal and Asherah and also used national power to capture and kill God's people. Jezebel's sins were so severe that Obadiah had to hide a hundred people of God from her, and she even sent assassins to kill Elijah after the incident at Mount Carmel, God punished Ahab and Jezebel through Jehu's coup d'etat. Second point, Jehu rose as the tenth king of North Israel. Through Jehu's coup d'etat, the Omni monarchy came to a close. The reason the soldiers took off their robes and placed it beneath Jehu was a performance to show that they would be loyal to Jehu. They furthermore blew their trumpets to proclaim Jehu as their king. When Jehu became king, he officially carried out a coup d'etat against the Omni dynasty. Ahab's son, Joram, escaped by learning to South Judah. But Jehu tracked him down and killed him, as well as killing Ahaziah. Ahaziah was the son born between Ahab and Jezebel's daughter and Jehoram. So in fact, Joram was Ahaziah's uncle. As such, the Omni dynasty began from Omni to Ahab, Ahab to Ahaziah, and Ahaziah to Joram, and then ended due to Jehu's coup d'etat. 
Jehu's coup meant that North Israel's Joram and South Judah's Ahaziah were killed, as well as Jezebel being killed. Jezebel's death was predicted by Elijah, and it was fulfilled during the days of Jehu. Third point, the first round of Jehu's religious reformation was to get rid of remnants from Ahab's monarchy. At his first religious reformation, Jehu completely got rid of the remnants of Ahab's monarchy. He firstly killed all 70 of Ahab's sons. Jehu received the surrender from the leaders of Samaria and then commanded to kill Ahab's sons. Thus, they not only killed Ahab's sons, but all who were associated with Ahab. He secondly killed the 42 brothers of South Judah's Ahaziah. He suddenly received the support from Jehonadab from Rechab, who was a respected religious figure of the time. He forcibly broke down the remaining of Ahab's temples. Fourth point, Jehu's second religious reformation was to eradicate the Temple of the Baals. At the first religious reformation, Jehu eradicated all of Ahab's monarchy. And then for the second religious reformation, he eradicated the Baal worshippers. In order to get rid of the Baal worshippers, he firstly made news that Baal worship would be strengthened. He secondly prepared for a major gathering of Baal worshippers and then planned to kill all those who came. He eventually killed all the Baal worshippers in North Israel. Fifth point. Unfortunately, they also followed in the way of Jeroboam. Despite getting rid of Ahab dynasty's evil and the Baal worshippers, Jehu still went in the way of Jeroboam by not getting rid of the golden covers at Dan and Bethel. However, as he managed to do some good, God blessed him by enabling four of his descendants to continue the monarchy. Next after Jehu was Jehoahaz, Jehoashi, Jeroboam II, and then Zechariah. As Jehu followed in the way of Jeroboam, North Israel suffered from external attack. Eventually, North Israel lost their land on the east of the Jordan River to the Aram soldiers. And then they were attacked by Sharman Ezra the Sad in Assyria. Jehu therefore had to pay tribute to Sharman Ezra the Sad on his knees. This episode is clearly demonstrated in the Black Obelisk on display at the British Museum. Day 168, 2 Kings 11 to 14, Amos, Hosea, and Jonah's historical context. In South Judah, the throne which was taken by Athaliah by force was restored by Joash. North Israel prospered in the age of Jeroboam II. First point, priest Jehoiada tried to keep to the way of David in South Judah. When Jehu killed Joram from the north and Ahaziah from the south, Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, and so she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family. Whilst this was happening, Jehoshiba, the daughter of King Jehoram, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and raised him in secret for six years. And in the seventh year, Jehoiada led a revolution. This included securing the commanders of a unit of a hundred, the Kairite and the goddess. Jehoiada, moreover, used the day of Sabbath for the revolution. Jehoiada used three of the five groves of goddess in the palace for the revolution and the remaining two groups to protect the temple. The next thing Jehoiada did was to place the eighth-year-old Joash as the eighth king of South Judah. And finally, Athaliah was starved to death by the people of South Judah. Second point, Jehoiada helped King Joash to strengthen a kingdom of priests in South Judah. 
So Hoyada, who was able to seize Athaliah, made Joash the new king of South Judah and carried out a religious reformation. Jehoiada made the people remember the covenant they had made with God. Jehoiada also got rid of the idols in South Judah. Next, the temple was restored in order for offerings to be made again. As such, Jehoiada succeeded in the religious reformation and was successful in making Joash the new king. During the days when Jehoiada was alive, the people of South Judah were good at keeping the laws of the kingdom of priests. Joash restored the temple as instructed by Jehoiada. However, despite the order of Joash to restore the temple, nothing was done for 23 years. This was because the finances and the resources for the temple were not sufficient. So, Joash tried to find a solution for this. The priests were responsible for collecting the funds for restoration. But this time, Joash commanded the people to collect the funds and for the king and the priests to check on this. Joash, moreover, hired professionals for the restoration. The reason this was all possible was because Joash had secured the finances for the restoration as well as the living expenses of the priests. But Joash, who was dedicated to God, started to have a change in heart. This happened when priest Jehoiada died, and the leaders of South Judah started to shift Joash's heart towards the idols. Thus, Joash changed towards the late years of his rule, and therefore was unable to avoid God's punishment. God's punishment was as follows. The first of these punishments was Hazael, king of Aram, attacking South Judah. The second was that Joash had to offer tribute to Hazael. The third was that Joash was killed by his servants. Third point. The Omni monarchy came to an end when the Jehu monarchy began, and this was when Elisha died. Elisha became ill, and so Jehoash, the king of North Israel, came to see him. Although Jehoash called Elisha my father, he had no intention of following his instructions. Jehoash reported the political circumstances with Aram to Elisha. So, despite being ill, Elisha delivered God's message through symbolic gestures. Facing death, Elisha worked hard until the end. Elisha's words to take the arrow and to hit the ground all related to war. And by placing his hands on Jehoash's hands, he gave God's strength to him. But unfortunately, Jehoash did not believe in God's strength. Elisha was angry at Jehoash because of this. To the commandment to strike the arrow on the ground, Jehoash only struck three times. Therefore, he heard that he would not be able to win fully against Aram. Afterwards, although Jehoash was able to restore the land taken from Aram, he was not able to fully win. First point. Amaziah, who was the ninth king of South Judah, was taken as a captive by the twelfth king of North Israel, Jehoash. In the second year of Jehoash of North Israel, Joash in South Judah became murdered by his servants. And so his son Amaziah became the ninth king of South Judah. After seeing his father murdered at the age of 25, Amaziah led the next 29 years with force, and so he was able to make South Judah rich and powerful. And when he was at his strongest, he killed the servants who killed his father. But keeping to the laws of Moses, he did not kill their children. Amaziah furthermore counted men who were 20 years old and above from the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, which added up to 300,000 and appointed captains of a thousand and a hundred. Amaziah used 200 pieces of silver to hire 100,000 soldiers from those Israel. 
This was because Amaziah was preparing for war against Edom. But God intervened in Amaziah's plan. God told him to return the soldiers to lose Israel and to not get them involved in this war. And so Amaziah returned the soldiers back to lose Israel. Amaziah listened to God and took the 300,000 to fight and won the war against Edom. But this war flew in a strange direction afterwards. The 100,000 soldiers who had to return to North Israel became angry that they could not fight, and so they laid the towns belonging to Judah, from Samaria to Bethlehem, and killed 3,000 people, and then carried off great quantities of plunder. And so South Judah had to fight with Edom and then with North Israel. And because of this, South Judah's lands in Jerusalem became severely damaged. Jehoash took Amaziah as captive, and he was only able to return to South Judah after Jehoash's death. Fifth point, the abundance during the 13th king of North Israel, Jeroboam II, became the historical background for Amos, Hosea, and Jonah. The 13th king of North Israel was Jeroboam II, and he expanded the territories of North Israel the most and recorded a period of great abundance. For the next 50 years, North Israel was not attacked by surrounding countries and enjoyed great wealth. During this time, God sent his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from God's heifer to North Israel. North Israel was to remember God's mercy. Day 169, Amos 1 to 5. Amos's Justice. Declaring God's judgment against the surrounding countries and North Israel, Amos pleaded with them to establish righteousness and justice throughout the nation. First point. In order to make the people of North Israel return to God, God sent prophets Elijah, Elisha, and also Amos. During the Omni dynasty, God sent Elijah and Elisha to North Israel to set them straight. During the economically prosperous times of Jeroboam II, God sent prophets again to remind them of God's laws. God sent them Amos. Amos ministered during the days of South Judah's Uzziah and North Israel's Jeroboam II. Amos was a shepherd of Tekoa, but God sent Amos, who was from South Judah, to deliver God's message in North Israel. So Amos went to North Israel and started to deliver God's words. Although he was not a high priest or from the royal family like the other prophets, Amos delivered God's message with the heart of God who was most distressed. Amos went to North Israel and started to speak about Aram, Philistine, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, Moab, South Judah, and North Israel and told them of their sins. He warned that they were to receive God's punishment. What Amos clearly pointed out was that God ruled over the entire world and that Israel was not to rely on their surrounding countries but only on God. A second point, God governs the whole world and the history. Amos mentioned the six countries that surrounded South Judah and North Israel and warned that they would receive God's punishment. Amos said that God would punish Aram. This was what he said. The king of Assyria complied by attacking Damascus and capturing it. He deported its inhabitants to Kerr and put resin to death. The second regarded the Philistines. This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning the Philistines before Pharaoh attacked Gaza. The Philistines later became conquered by Alexander during the Hellenistic Empire. 
The third was about tire. Amos said that tire would be conquered in the hands of Alexander during the Hellenistic Empire. The fourth concerned Edom. The Edomite, who had descended from Issa, helped the Babylonian Empire when they attacked their brother country, Jerusalem. And this was regarded as wicked in the eyes of God. Regarding Edom, Amos claimed that when Rome destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70, Edom would also fall. The fifth concerned Ammon. Ammon, along with Moab, continuously attacked Israel. Therefore, Amos told them that Ammon's capital city would be conquered by Babylon. Next was judgment on Moab. Moab too was to be conquered by Babylon. Regarding South Judah, Amos told them that they did not keep God's laws, and so they were to be conquered by Babylon in 586 BC. Third point. Through Amos, God revealed the exact sins of Samaria in those Israel. Amos told the seven countries surrounding those Israel of God's punishment on them, and now Amos spoke of the punishment for those Israel. Amos claimed that those Israel had no justice, and that they made slaves out of their people and collected way too much tax. God called North Israel a fallen country, as well as one which did not obey God's laws. They did not care about the foreigners or the laws of the Nazirite. Amos told them that they were to fall under the Assyrian army in 722 BC. God's judgment on North Israel, Sir Amos, started with here the descendants of Israel. God told them the faults of their leaders, and also told them that they would be punished for their sins. God told them that all they did was work in the way of Jeroboam. Fourth point, God rebuked the sins of the wealthy people in Samaria. Through Amos, God outlined the sins of North Israel one by one. The first concerned the nobles of North Israel. Hear this word. You cows of Bashan and Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and cross the needy and say to your husbands, bring us some drinkers. God told them that they ignored the poor and took from them, oppressed the poor and cross the needy. They had no heart for God, but acted as though they were religious. God told them that they would be punished. Despite their country's warnings, they neither listened to God nor repent when God took away their food. They did not repent even when there was a drought. They did not repent even when they were faced with natural disasters or when there was a disease. God had sent them punishments to make them return to Him, but they refused to become God's people. Thus, they had to hear God's message of punishment through Amos. Fifth point, Amos proclaimed God's day when there would be judgment and he furthermore told the people to repent. After telling them of the punishment they would get, Amos pleaded with the people to return to God. Amos sang a lamenting song. He then asked the people to return to God. Amos proclaimed God's day. Amos said that God would judge those who falsely offered to him. Hosea mentioned the same thing. Despite all this, Amos did not give up on those Israel and asked them to repent. Amos eventually had to predict the fall of those Israel. Day 170, Amos 6-9 to The Five Visions of Amos Letting them know the last days of those Israel, God declared their histories this continuation and promised the beginning of a new hope. First point, Amos proclaimed the fall of those Israel. Amos, who was from South Judah, was called by God to go to those Israel and tell them of their fall. Amos, moreover, had to proclaim that their fall was most certainly bound to happen 
and they read to tell the leaders of their sins. Amos very specifically went into the evil behavior of the nobles of those Israel. Amos claimed that they were only interested in satisfying their own needs and completely neglected the poor and the weak, and so God decided to punish them without mercy. What they should have done was to correctly use their privileges and to carry out their laws properly. They abused and enjoyed their status and did no good with it. They made the poor even poorer and made the weak even more helpless. This was very different to the days of David, when the people were able to keep to the laws of a kingdom of priests whilst being protected within the walls of the city. Amos of all proclaimed, that North Israel would be destroyed by Assyria in 722 BC. Second point, through five visions, Amos predicted the fall and aftermath of North Israel. The visions that Amos saw were five in total, which were grasshoppers, fire, plumb line, summer fruits, and also the destruction of the temple. The grasshopper ate all the grass in North Israel and led to their fall. Amos prayed to God to change his will and to save the people of North Israel. During the reign of Menahem in North Israel, tiglath Pileser the third from Assyria invaded. But God heard Amos' prayer and eased the burden so that the people were not massacred. The second vision Amos saw was fire. Tiglath Pileser invaded North Israel and some of the people were taken as captives to Assyria. The third vision Amos saw was the plumb line. A plumb line was used to elect buildings and to set the structure straight. The plumb line shown by God revealed that God had measured their sins carefully and the result was their destruction. But in the heart of God, we can see how despite all this, He still wanted to forgive and love His people. Third point, Amos and Amaziah from Bethel started their conflict. During the vision of Amos, the opposition between Amos and priest Amaziah from Bethel continued. When Amos continually proclaimed the fall of North Israel, Amaziah, the priest from Bethel, reported this to Jeroboam II in North Israel and threatened him to return to South Judah. And so Amos proclaimed the fall of North Israel and also the house of Amaziah. Fourth point, the fourth vision of Amos was judgment and the fifth was the destruction of the temple. The fourth vision seen by Amos was summer fruits. God showed him the sins of the people that could not be forgiven. God said that he would not forgive the people who did not know or care to know about the meaning of offering or Sabbath. The people of North Israel were more concerned about being unable to earn money on Sabbath rather than actually keeping Sabbath. God also said that he would not forgive them for their wasteful spending and false scales. God said that they would not be forgiven for sweeping the poor. The last vision Amos saw was the destruction of the temple. Although God spoke about the fall of those Israel, he still spoke of his plans to save the remaining people. Fifth point, Amos claimed Bible promises regarding the everlasting kingdom of God. Whilst God spoke about the destruction of North Israel to Amos, he also gave the five promises to restore them. This concerned the everlasting kingdom of God and also the coming of the Messiah. God first promised that David's monarchy would be restored. Second, God promised them that they would possess the entire world as their enterprise. Third, God promised them abundance in reaping. Fourth, God promised that their destroyed lands would be restored. Fifth, God promised that they would become everlasting people in the kingdom of God. Day 171, Hosea 
one to four. Hosea's burning heart. Hosea realized God's faithful and inseparable love for North Israel through marriage with Goma, who was an adulterous woman. First point. To North Israel, who disregarded their mission in the kingdom of priests, for the past 200 years, Hosea made the final plea. To compare the two prophets who both ministered during 8th century BC, Amos was from South Judah, who was called to North Israel, in order to point out the faults of the people as well as to proclaim their fall. As for Hosea, he was from North Israel, and God called him to criticize the people's religious faults and was furthermore told to understand God's heart through his own life's circumstances. Hosea put his life into telling the people God's message, but the people of North Israel did not listen to Amos or Hosea. They were focused on serving the Baals and Ashur that was established 200 years ago. After a long wait, God sent Hosea to give them their final warning. God told Hosea to marry Goma, who was an adulterous woman and her servant of the Baals. He was to marry her and have adulterous children. Through this, God explained to Hosea about the conditions of his heart for the past 200 years. Although married to Hosea, Goma still went to the temple of the Baals and continued with her adulterous lifestyle. But God told him to continue loving her as his wife. Second point, Hosea obeyed God's command to marry an adulterous woman. Hosea ministered during the times of Jeroboam II, which was an abundant and prosperous time for North Israel. Through the names of the children born by Goma, God sent his message to North Israel. The names of the three children were the following. The first was Jezreel. The name symbolized God's punishment of the house of Ahab and the servant of the Baals by Jehu. The second child's name was Loluhama. Her name meant not shown mercy. God said that he would no longer show his mercy to Israel. However, God said that he will continue to show mercy to South Judah. The third child's name was Lo Ame. The name meant not my people. God himself named the three children and their names all had meaning in showing God's heart and plan. But God still showed love and mercy even amid such circumstances. God said that even if one's wife and children were adulterous, how could he stop loving or caring for them? This was the theme of Hosea and his life. Third point, God yearned for North Israel to return to him by repenting. In Hosea chapter 2, God gives Israel their message of restoration. God gave them a day of restoration to look forward to. God gave them this message and furthermore used Gomo as an example to reveal the sins of those Israel. The reason God proclaimed punishment on those Israel can be found in Hosea 2 verses 7 to 8. The meaning of returning to my husband here was a reference to the people returning to God. God told them of what would happen if they refused to return to him until the end. The first was that they would have nothing to reap during harvest. The second was that North Israel would be ridiculed. The third was that they would not be allowed to make an offering to God. The fourth was that the grounds of North Israel would be destroyed. The fifth was that North Israel would be punished as much as the days they worshipped the idols. As God told them of their punishments, he waited for them to return to him. We can see how God could not let go of his people because of his mercy and love. Fourth point, 
Hosea's burning heart, after praying to get his adulterous wife back, resembled God's burning heart. God told Hosea to bring back Oma, who was staying with another man. So Hosea went to collect her and paid the man to get his wife back. Hosea promised to love Gomer again. The sum Hosea had to pay to get Gomer back was 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a red sack of barley. This sum was the amount that was paid to buy a servant. Here we are reminded of the 30 pieces of silver Judas Iscariot was paid to betray Jesus. What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. Fifth point, Hosea proclaimed nine summons regarding those Israel's sins. After praying to get his wife back, Hosea started his series of nine summons to the people of those Israel. The first summon outlined the sins of those Israel. The second summon told of God's punishment on them that was to come. Hosea proclaimed that the entirety of North Israel was about to fall. The third summon outlined the faults of the priests. The fourth summon told of God's punishment for the priests as well as the people. The fifth summon rebuked the people for worshiping idols. The sixth sermon was about how he hoped South Judah would not be like North Israel. South Judah was told not to go to Gilgal, although this was the place where the Mana generation crossed the Jordan River. Gilgal had become a place of severe idol worship. The remaining summons continue in the following chapters. Day 172. Hosea 5-9 Hosea's proclamation, the three-step punishment to the people who worshipped idols and sacrificed to God for show, God said that he desired love rather than sacrifice. First point, Hosea claimed that because the royals and the nobles of North Israel had no knowledge about God, this would lead to their downfall. Hosea continued on with his summons to deliver God's message. Hosea shouted to the priests and the nobles to listen, realize, and also to pay attention. He criticized them for not knowing God and for their sins because of their lack of knowledge about God. The nobles and priests provided the initial reason for the collapse of North Israel that was to come. They led the people in adulterous and evil ways. Therefore, Hosea claimed that they would fall because of their arrogance, and furthermore claimed that South Judah, who followed in their ways, would also fall. To North Israel, Hosea claimed, Sound the trumpet in Gibeah, the horn in Ramah, raise the battle cry in Beth Aben, read on Benjamin. Hosea mentioned Gibeah, Lama, and Beth Aven, who were also following in the ways of those Israel, and that God would punish them also. These cities were all a part of South Judah, and this was God's warning to them. Hosea claimed that judgment on North Israel and South Judah would start. North Israel and South Judah had not relied on God but on Assyria and Egypt, and they were to be judged for this. Hosea mentioned the fall of South Judah, captivity in Babylon, and also the return of the captives all together. Second point, Hosea pleaded with the people to learn about God. Although North Israel and South Judah could not escape their punishment, God nevertheless proclaimed how Israel was to be restored in the future. Amos, Hosea, and all the other prophets during this time collectively told the people to return to God. Hosea would not have known God immediately when he was born, but Hosea obeyed in God and even married 
and other Tara's soul, which made him relate to God's heart in loving those Israel. Hosea's sermon continued. God told Sir Hosea that North Israel and South Judah had no love towards God in wanting his people to follow in the ways of a kingdom of priests. God said, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgment of God rather than burnt offerings. Third point, Hosea criticized the internal and external faults of those Israel. Those Israel's internal fail was exposed when God tried to heal them. Those Israel lied, stole, took bribery, and was full of evil. In other words, the people lived as if there was no law. Their hearts were so evil that they were prepared to commit evil at any time. Those Israel saw a series of coup d'etat. God also rebuked the external faults of those Israel. Even when the people saw hardship, they did not turn to God. All they did was to rely on stronger countries. They relied more on Assyria than they did on God. Thus, they were unable to escape God's judgment. Fourth point, to those Israel who followed in the way of Jeroboam for the past 200 years, Hosea proclaimed that even if they relied on other strong countries, they had no way out. Finally, the fall of North Israel was proclaimed. The main reason was because they had followed in the way of Jeroboam for the past 200 years. No matter how much they relied on powerful countries, nothing could save them now. Up until now, they did not offer a proper offering to God once. God emphasized this again through the prophet Isaiah. And as God said earlier, he proclaimed that South Judah would also fall after North Israel. This punishment was according to God's words on Mount Ebal. Fifth point, Hosea proclaimed that North Israel would be taken as captive according to the laws in the kingdom of priests. Through Hosea, God rebuked the people for returning his blessings with idol worship and idolatry. God explained the punishment they would receive for the evil. God furthermore rebuked the prophet who just stood there instead of telling the people that the end was coming. God explained the wickedness behind their idol worship. God told them how they did not appreciate or acknowledge God's great love and blessing. Now, God proclaimed through Hosea that they would be taken as captives for their punishment. This was the third stage of punishment warned by God earlier in Leviticus. I will scatter you among the nations and will draw out my swords and pursue you. Your land will be laid waste and your cities will lie in ruin. Day 173 Hosea 10 to 14. Burning mercy, trial for the cross. Revealing the heart of love for the disobedient people of North Israel, God earnestly pleaded with them to return to Him once again. First point. Although God's heart towards Israel was consistently the same, North Israel had only half a heart for God. North Israel halved their heart for God when Jeroboam created his way of making idols in Dan and Bethel. God informed Hosea of the current times by comparing it to the period of Gibeah. The Gibeah period God reported to here was during the era of the judges, when the tribe of Benjamin almost perished. By referring to the Gibeah period, God warned the people that they could disappear without a trace if they did not repent. This was their last opportunity given by God to repent. God continued to judge the sins of North Israel. The people had turned away from God and had lived according to their greed and desires 
but this was all about to change. To the people who bowed down to the idols, God told them to return to him. Through Hosea, God told them that it was their opportunity to repent. Their evil was so bad that it resembled the Gibeah instant. They were to find an exit before it was really too late. Second point, God's everlasting love towards North Israel was continued through the prophets regarding the coming of the Messiah. Through Hosea, God told the people of his love for North Israel. God told them how he had protected them from long ago. Then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. This message reappears later when Mary, Joseph, and Jesus flee from Herod. God told them that they who disobeyed their father were to receive punishment. Despite their sins, however, God still revealed his mercy. How can I give you up Ephraim? How can I hand you over Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. Towards the end days of North Israel, God still clearly revealed his love. God had to punish them, but yet he could not at the same time. God's ultimate love was revealed through Jesus Christ. Although the people of North Israel were sent as captives to Assyria because of their sin, as God had delivered their ancestors in Egypt previously, God would deliver them with his great love. Third point, North Israel did not repent to God until the end and tried to solve the situation by asking help from other countries. The people did not listen to the last warning of Hosea, and when things started to look bad, they tried to solve the problems through international relations and political strategies. So with a disappointed heart, God once again told the people through the prophet Hosea of their last opportunity to repent. God rebuked the people for their arrogance and their sins, as well as their wickedness in not admitting their sins. God furthermore rebuked them for not listening to God's prophet. The people also forgot about God's past grace. Thus, they were unable to escape God's judgment. First point, Hosea claimed that the governing reason behind the destruction of North Israel was due to their idol worship. Among the many sins of the people of North Israel, their representative sin was idol worship. When Ephraim spoke, people trembled. He was exalted in Israel, but he became guilty of Baal worship and died. So God told them that they who forgot God and worshipped idols would indeed be punished. God spoke of judgment by referring to the time when the people requested a king back in the days of Samuel and also when Jeroboam had departed from the ways of David to establish North Israel. North Israel had neglected a kingdom of priests. Fifth point. Hosea's last cry was that those who repented would receive God's blessing. Now, this was Hosea's final cry. Return, Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously, that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria cannot save us. We will not mount war horses. We will never again say our gods to what our own hands have made, for in you the Father is find compassion. Hosea told the people to return and to present the offering of repentance to God. 
they were to obey God only and to never again serve idols. The final message was that God would bless those who repented. Israel, that was to be restored, would be glorious. Day 174, Jonah 1 to 4. Disobedient to Jonah, love for all nations. Jonah, who had a long concept of a chosen people, came to realize God's great will through the repentance of the people of Nineveh and the love of God who forgave them. First point, God's heart towards the whole world was recorded in the book of Jonah. Nineveh was one of the oldest cities in the Mesopotamian region during Jonah's times. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, a prospering city, by carrying out unfair trade and to tell them God's message. But Jonah had plans of his own and so disobeyed God. Jonah understood God's instructions clearly that he would have mercy on them if they repented. But Jonah wanted Nineveh to be punished by God. So he went in the opposite direction to Tarshish. God therefore sent a huge storm. God also exposed that Jonah was the reason for the storm. Jonah told the people to throw him into the sea. God, however, prepared a huge fish which was to be Jonah's new home for three days and three nights. Second point, the three days in the valley of a fish for Jonah was connected to Jesus' resurrection of three days. Jonah prayed to God to save him after the great storm. God therefore made him live in the belly of a huge fish for three days. Jonah said a prayer of thanks. Jonah moreover promised God that he would obey him and so God made the fish spit him out. This instant and Jesus' resurrection is connected. He answered, the wicked and the adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Third point, Jonah experienced God's great mercy in the capital city of Assyria, Nineveh. Now Jonah could no longer disobey God's command, and so he made his way to Nineveh and started to deliver God's message. However, instead of putting his heart into it, Jonah only did the bare minimum. Jonah walked the town only for a day instead of three and unwillingly proclaimed God's word. He claimed that in 40 days, Nineveh would fall unless they repented and turned to God. But something incredible happened. The people of Nineveh listened and repented from king to the lowest servant. So God had mercy on them. Fourth point, God's answer to Moses' prayer and Jonah's prayer were one. When the people of Nineveh repented after hearing Jonah's message, God granted them mercy. But Jonah became angry at this and complained to God. Jonah was angry at the fact that they were forgiven. Therefore, he prayed to God with a twisted reference of his laws. When the people made a golden calf in the past, Moses had prayed for their lives with his own life on the line. Jonah, who knew this, twisted its meaning and used it to complain to God. Jonah did not care too much about God's love for all nations, or that he miraculously saved him from the huge fish. He forgot that Abraham's covenant with God was based on all nations. The reason God sent the prophet to North Israel, South Judah, and even to Nineveh was because of his love for all nations. Jonah comes to understand this soon. Fifth point. Jonah's record was true obedience towards God's love for all nations. Jonah believed that Nineveh would fall in 40 days, and he actually wished for this. 
Jonah went around the city for only a day and then waited for their fall. But God then took a leafy plant to teach him a lesson. God wanted to teach his heart to him. Should I not have a concern for the great city of Nineveh? This question reveals how God wished to save all nations and how he waited for the sinners to repent. God taught Jonah, who had the long concept of a chosen people, and showed him his vision for all nations. And so when Jonah heard this, he did not add his own thoughts or interpretations, but left his book to end with God's question. Therefore, we should not just think of Jonah as a disobedient prophet. Jonah worked as God's great partner. Day 175, 2 Kings 15-16 Assyrian Empire's Entrance, the Decline of the North The threat of new empire Assyria approached, and rebellions continued in North Israel. North Israel, who left God, was thrown into a great crisis. First point, the 10th king of South Judah, Uzziah, was able to form a stable kingdom through the help of the prophet Zechariah. The reign of Jeroboam II came to an end in North Israel, and through the series of coup d'etat, five kings, Zechariah, Shalom, Menahem, Pekahiah, and Pekah came and went. During this time in South Judah, Azariah or Uzziah was reigning for 52 years in peace. King Uzziah managed to follow in his father's ways and did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. This was thanks to the prophet Zechariah's help. South Judah had conquered Philistine and furthermore was receiving tribute from Ammon. But when the prophet Zechariah died, Uzziah became arrogant and tried to act like a priest, and so God punished him. He consequently suffered from leprosy, and so had to step out of his palace. In the meantime, his son, Jotham, became king. Second point, coup d'etat continued in North Israel ferociously. Zechariah, who became king after Jeroboam II, only reigned for six months, as Shalom orchestrated a coup d'etat. During the six months, all Zechariah did was to follow in Jeroboam's way. Zechariah's death through Shalom's coup d'etat was fulfillment of God's words to Jehu. Jehu's descendants were Jehu Ahaz, Jehu Ash, Jeroboam II, and Zechariah. But Shalom, who killed Zechariah, only reigned for a month due to the coup d'etat by Menahem. Shalom also went in the way of Jeroboam for the months he reigned. Menahem became king in such circumstances. As such, the kings of North Israel did not give much thought to David's way of a kingdom of priests, but rather craved the power for themselves. Those who possessed the power through coup d'etat all went in the way of Jeroboam. Jeroboam's acts of making golden calf idols in Dan and Bethel was followed by his successors, and this eventually led to the downfall of the country. Menahem ruled for 10 years, and during those years, he went in the way of Jeroboam. He had to offer tribute to Assyria for survival. Menahem made North Israel pay tribute to Assyria. One good thing for him was that he did not get murdered and was able to pass down his monarchy to his son. But his son Pekahiah also went in the way of Jeroboam for the two years. He reigned and then died because of the next coup d'etat. Third point, Pekah, the king of North Israel, made an alliance with Lezin, the king of Aram, to go against Assyria. The 18th king of North Israel, Pekah, went in the way of Jeroboam for the 20 years he reigned. 
Pekka chose to make an alliance with the powerful Aram instead of turning to God. He made an alliance with the king of Aram called Lessin in order to go against Assyria. Pekka furthermore proposed to South Judah to join the alliance, but South Judah refused this alliance. Then, Aram and North Israel threatened to attack South Judah first. When South Judah became desperate, they instead made an alliance with Assyria. Assyria then attacked Aram and North Israel. Pekka's alliance resulted in the people of North Israel being taken captive to Assyria. But this punishment had been forewarned previously in Leviticus. Fourth point, the twelfth king of South Judah, Ahaz, made an alliance with Assyria after feeling threatened from the alliance between North Israel and Aram. During the time North Israel was in the process of its fall, the twelfth king of South Judah called Ahaz ruled for 16 years and did evil in the eyes of God. Ahaz is easily one of the worst kings of South Judah. Ahaz served the idols of Ammon, and after rejecting the proposal to join the North Israel Aram alliance, South Judah was threatened by North Israel and Aram. When things became desperate for South Judah, Ahaz called to Assyria for help. Fifth point, Isaiah told King Ahaz that Assyria came into sin for God's management of a kingdom of priests. When North Israel and Aram attacked South Judah, Ahaz showed the Assyrian king the treasures and storage areas of the Jerusalem palace and the temple and pleaded for help. When this proposal came, Assyria stepped on board as they were looking for an opportunity to attack. But it was here that God sent Isaiah and told them a way to be saved. Isaiah told Ahaz not to be afraid of the alliance between North Israel and Aram, and that they were to ask for God's help. Ahaz made it out to Isaiah that he was too holy to ask God for a sign, and instead sent gifts and tribute to the Assyrian king asking for help. Ahaz moreover elected the Assyrian idol in the temple through Uriah, who was a failed prophet. Ahaz went to Assyria and was most impressed when he saw the Assyrian idol. To Ahaz, the Assyrian god appeared much stronger than the real god. Day 176 2 Kings chapter 17 to chapter 18 verse 12 The start of the 800-year Samaritans Those Israel that had followed the way of Jeroboam was eventually judged by God and destroyed, and Hezekiah of South Judah began a formation. First point. Those Israel who went in the way of Jeroboam for the past 200 years came to a cross in 8th century BC with the rise of the Assyrian Empire. Hosea became the 19th and the final king of North Israel. From the days of Pekar, Hosea stopped paying tribute to Assyria and rather made an alliance with Egypt. But in the ancient days, if a country stopped paying tribute to another country, this was a reason for war. So the fact that North Israel stopped paying tribute to Assyria showed that they were prepared for war. North Israel, however, eventually fell in the hands of Assyria. Second point, the reason those Israel fell was because they ignored the last warning about a kingdom of priests. There were a few reasons why North Israel fell. The first was because they forgot God's blessing of Exodus and later followed in the ways of foreign countries. The second was because they served idols. The third was because they ignored the warning of the prophets and did not return to God 
until the end. The force was because they did all that was wicked in the eyes of God. Third point, the ten tribes of Israel were punished with a level three punishment recorded in Leviticus and consequently driven out from the promised land. As God warned them, North Israel lost their land and was taken away. This was the third step of punishment recorded in Leviticus. Fourth point, Samaria, which became a mixed race community due to the management of Assyria, was recovered through Jesus 800 years later. North Israel fell in the hands of Assyria, and according to the empire's management, North Israel became a mixed race nation. Assyria mixed the races in order for the people to not form a riot or to stand against them. This led to many races being mixed, and furthermore, the formation of the Samaritans. The key word of Assyria's management was boundary. By mixing races and blurring the boundaries between the lands, the Assyrian Empire planned to dominate the world by preventing any nation from standing up against them. What they did not know was that God used them as a tool to set straight his kingdom of priests. God had given Assyria the power to mix laces and also to blur the boundaries. God was the one who made the boundaries and the laces in the first place. In terms of religion, Assyria made the people believe in mixed idols and also made them believe in the Assyrian gods. In other words, they even mixed up religion. When the people of North Israel became mixed races, the people of South Judah disassociated themselves with North Israel altogether. This relationship continued for 800 years. This problem was solved 800 years later. First, Jesus used the Samaritans in his story and this opened the hearts of the Jews. Second, Jesus restored the Samaritans through the story of the people with leprosy. Third, Jesus had a conversation with a Samaritan woman and thus restored them. Fourth, Jesus commanded for the restoration of the Samaritans with his legacy of the Great Commission. Fifth point, Hezekiah from South Judah witnessed the fall of North Israel and thus decided to go in the way of David. North Israel fell completely after 200 years and now South Judah stood alone. South Judah continued for another 150 years. When North Israel fell, South Judah's 13th king Hezekiah ruled for 29 years. Hezekiah was the son of Ahaz, who was regarded as a terrible king. In the past, when Solomon became king after his father David, Israel enjoyed great prosperity and happiness. But when Hezekiah became king after his father, the country did not have good internal or external relations, and generally all was not doing well. But fortunately, Hezekiah went in the way of David. Day 177 Isaiah Handling International Relations The calling of Isaiah, who was sent to South Judah, was to turn the people away from their social evils and to re-establish them as God's people once more. First point Regarding Israel's 500 years of monarchy, God made three conclusions. Abraham's descendants managed to enter the promised land some time after Exodus. After that, they were able to live in this land for 350 years. During the era of the judges and also 500 years after that, after Saul, David, and then Solomon, the country became divided into two. And then North Israel went on for 200 years, 
and South Judah went on for a further 150 years. God evaluated the 500 years of monarchy on three occasions. The first was during the days of Samuel that warned what monarchy would be like. The second was during Isaiah. The third was during Jeremiah. Second point, God's management of the world involved making Israel experience both high and low. God gave both highs and lows to the Israelites in war. Whenever they obeyed, God made them succeed. And whenever they disobeyed, God made them lose. To look at a few examples of success, one was between Moses and Egypt. There was also Joshua against the Canaanites, Gibeon against the Midianites, Samuel against the Philistines, and David and Solomon against the surrounding countries. To look at a few cases of failed wars, one was North Israel against Assyria, and the other South Judah against Babylon. Through so Isaiah, God proclaimed that the whole world was his. God used Assyria as his tool. He used Assyria to punish North Israel and made them into mixed race people. Next, God used Babylon as his tool to punish South Judah and made the people into Babylon captives. Third, God used Persia as his tool to rule over Jerusalem. God's management of the world is like a coin with judgment on one side and salvation on the other. Back in the days of Abraham, God said, that his interest was on all nations, and that Abraham's descendants would become the channel of blessing to bless all nations. God used Moses to establish a kingdom of priests, and this framework contained all nations. Third point, during the time those Israel fell, Isaiah was called as the prophet of South Judah. In 8th century BC, Amos and Hosea ministered in North Israel, and Isaiah and Micah ministered in South Judah. The Assyrian Empire had started around that time, and as for Rome, the legend of Romulus and Remus was being formed. Isaiah was an esteemed scholar of the time. Isaiah was well learned in God's laws and also someone who was able to read the political wind of the time. He ministered during the monarchy of Ahaz and Hezekiah. Isaiah's early ministry was made difficult by Ahaz, and his later ministry was busy, as he had to help Hezekiah from Assyria. Isaiah spoke a lot about the coming of the Messiah, as well as about God's judgment and the surrounding countries. Isaiah emphasized God's mercy and remnant. South Judah's punishment was outlined by God through Isaiah. The first was that they offered pointless offerings. What God looked for can be seen through what he said through Samuel. The second was that they did a great deal of evil. God told the people to repent. God said that he would wipe away their sins, on the condition that they repented, and this was the theme of Isaiah. God categorized those who repented and those who did not. Those who repented were his holy people. Those who did not repent were destined to perish. Fourth point, the prophet Isaiah spoke of the coming kingdom of God. The kingdom of God explained through Isaiah had the following content. The first was that it contained all nations. The second was that it was full of peace. The kingdom of God did not have swords and battles, but rather contained land and agriculture. In other words, battles would come to an end and all would be at peace. God explained this through Isaiah and then warned the people of the punishment that would come their way if they did not repent. 
These were God's words. Would to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. Isaiah proclaimed the punishment on the people who served idols and lost their humility. If they repented from their arrogant ways, then they would have a chance of living in peace. They would be able to dream of God's salvation. Fifth point, Isaiah rebuked the sins of the leaders of South Judah who led their people in the way of evil. Through Isaiah, God rebuked the faults of the leaders of South Judah. God said that they were responsible for leading the people into evil ways. God warned that the people would not have any food and that the leaders would be put down and there would be a lot of confusion in society. During those times, the priests abused the system of the kingdom of the priests in order to become wealthy. People also worshipped idols and ignored God's words. God proclaimed that the prosperity of the leaders would be taken away from them. During those times, women dressed extravagantly and were arrogant from their material goods. God proclaimed that this was their arrogance. They loved material goods more than they loved God, and the humbleness was nowhere to be found. When the day of God's judgment came, the whole world would be confused, and these materials would become worthless. The reason why they had to endure ridicule later was because of such arrogance. Day 178, Isaiah 4-7 Isaiah's warning, do not make alliances. Through Isaiah, God showed us the blueprint of hope of continuing the history of Judah and Jerusalem through holy seed and stamp. First point, Isaiah proclaimed that there would be restoration for the remaining people and that there will also be God's glory. Isaiah told the people of South Judah of the ridicule they would face. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man and say, We will eat our own food and provide our own cloth. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our disgrace. On the day of God's judgment, all the men would die from war and the people would be in danger of being extinct. However, Isaiah told the people that the remaining people would be able to live through God's judgment. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and joy of the survivors in Israel. Those who are left in Zion, who remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy all who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem. Here, Isaiah refers to the coming of the Messiah. Listen, High Priest Joshua, you and your associated seated before you, who are men, symbolic of things to come. I am going to bring my servant, the branch. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David, a righteous branch. A king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. Second point, Isaiah used the metaphor of a vineyard owner to explain God. Isaiah chapter 5 is called the Song of the Vineyard. This was because God was the owner of the vineyard. I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard. On a fertile hillside, God is the owner of the vineyard, and the people of South Judah was the fruit. Isaiah writes that God hoped that the vineyard would produce good fruits. Sadly, God claimed that rather than good fruits, the vineyard produced bad ones. God spoke of judgment regarding this. Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hatch, 
and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. God told them that he would no longer protect them from their enemies and make South Judah fall. God told the people of their sins through Isaiah. The first was that they did not keep to a kingdom of priests, and rather was faithful to their own desires. In other words, they did not keep jubilee. In this year of jubilee, everyone is to return to their own property. The second was that they focused on human pleasure. The third was that they lied continuously. The fourth was that they did not know how to distinguish between what was right and wrong. The fifth was that they were arrogant. The sixth was that they accepted bribery during trial. As such, God told them their sins and claimed that they would fall through war. As said by Isaiah, South Judah eventually fell. In the hands of the Babylonian Empire in 586 BC. Third point Isaiah was called by God whilst the seeing a vision of the temple. Isaiah was called by God when God showed him a vision of the temple. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. After seeing this vision, Isaiah experienced being cleansed from the charcoal fire. God had warned Isaiah of the evil of South Judah people. He said, Go and tell these people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. God furthermore told Isaiah of his plans to send some people as captives and others to remain in Jerusalem. God told Isaiah how the people were to be punished, but punishment was not the governing point. As God had judged the world with a flood during Noah's time, but then had a plan for salvation. God likewise had plans to restore Jerusalem after judgment. This is why God called Isaiah. Isaiah proclaimed both God's punishment and restoration of South Judah. Fourth point, Isaiah warned Ahaz not to make an alliance. During the time Isaiah was called by God, those Israel and Aram attacked Jerusalem, but they failed at seizing it. This record can be found both in Isaiah and two kings. To firstly look at the record in Isaiah, when Ahaz son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, king Rezin of Aram, and Pekah son of Lamaria, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now to look at the record in two kings, then Rezin king of Aram and Pekah son of Lamaria, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem and besieged Ahaz, but they could not overpower him. As such, South Judah was able to block the first attack. But during the second attack, things got serious and South Judah was seized by fear. Isaiah delivered God's message to the king and the people of South Judah. Although in theory they were in danger of being destroyed by North Israel and Aram, God told them not to worry as their reason for destruction was to be judgment. To Ahaz, who made an alliance with Assyria in order to protect South Judah from North Israel and Aram, Israel pleaded with him to change his ways. Isaiah told Ahaz to let go of Assyria for the following three reasons. The first was because they were not to give away any information regarding their brother nation, North Israel. The second was because if they became too close to Assyria, 
there was the danger of them bringing in Assyrian idols. The third was because Assyria could always decide to attack South Judah. Although Isaiah emphasized to Ahaz that Assyria was being used as God's tool, Ahaz did not care to listen. Instead, he was annoyed that Isaiah did not understand his political relations and strategies. However, Isaiah did not give up until the end and tried to persuade Ahaz. Ahaz was not to rely on Assyria or Egypt. This was because firstly, North Israel was decided by God to fall in the hands of Assyria. The second was because they were not to provide Assyria with any incentives to attack. The third was because Assyria could always inflict damage on South Judah. The fourth was because it was long to aid in the fall of their brother nation. The fifth was because there was the danger of Assyria's idols coming in. However, despite all these warnings, Ahaz did not listen until the end. Fifth point. God told Isaiah that the alliance between North Israel and Aram would fail. As proclaimed by Isaiah, North Israel fell and the people of North Israel became a mixed race nation through the policy of the Assyrian Empire. God tried to make Ahaz listen multiple times, but he did not listen until the end. It was here that God told Isaiah about the coming of the Messiah. Ahaz was unable to see the tricks and motives of the empires. Isaiah warned Ahaz not to believe in these powers and to believe in God. But Ahaz claimed that he did not want to test God and went ahead and predicted to the empires. Ahaz was not interested in God's power. He did not have the heart to rely on God. Thus, God gave Isaiah the message of Jesus Christ at this point. Eventually, South Judah was damaged by Assyria. Day 179, Isaiah 8 to 12. Assyrian Empire, God's tool of punishment. God, who declared that he would destroy Judah due to their sin, promised that he would prepare a highway of salvation after the day of wrath had passed. First point, God told Isaiah and Habakkuk to record his words on a scroll. God made Isaiah record the following message on a scroll in 8th century BC. The Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with an ordinary pen. So I called in Uriah the priest and Zechariah son of Jeberachiah as reliable witnesses for me. Later in 6th century BC, God made Habakkuk record God's message on a scroll for the Jews to read. The reference of Maha Shalal Hashbash and reliable witness was a warning that Aram's capital Damascus and North Israel's capital Samaria would both fall soon. This soon becomes their reality. The king of Assyria complied by attacking Damascus and capturing it. He deported its inhabitants to Kerr and put resin to death. God furthermore told Isaiah that Assyria would hit Aram and North Israel and then attack South Judah. God then told Isaiah of the people who would fall and the people who would be saved. God told Isaiah to beware of the false prophets and that the false prophets would be punished. God was making reference to the situation of South Judah. God rebuked the circumstances of South Judah for worshiping idols and also for relying on them. Second point. God told of the long future ahead as well as the immediate future through his prophets. In 8th century BC, God told his prophets of what was to happen to North Israel and how 800 years later, 
the Messiah would come. God told Isaiah about the coming of the Messiah. This was fulfilled 800 years later. God furthermore told Isaiah of the rule of the Messiah. This was later connected by the prophet Daniel. As such, God told Isaiah about the long future ahead as well as the immediate reality for North Israel and South Judah. God first told him about the fall of North Israel. God then told him about the sins of North Israel, which was the reason behind their destruction. Thus, they were unable to avoid God's punishment. Despite God telling South Judah about Emmanuel, as well as the image of Mahasharal Hashbaz, and the birth of the Messiah through Isaiah, the people did not listen and this made God burn in anger. Assyria was therefore to be used as God's tool. God is the living God who governs the world. Third point, Assyria was used as God's tool. God continued to outline the sins of the leaders of those Israel. The leaders did not care to remember the laws of Moses. God outlined their sins and then went on to talk about Assyria. Assyria was also very arrogant, as they did not know about God. Assyria did not govern the boundaries of the world. It was God. God spoke about Assyria's punishment that was to take place in the future. When the Lord has finished all his work against Mount Zion and Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look in his eyes. God explained that Assyria would be used to punish South Judah. And then Assyria would become punished later. The punishment on Assyria began during the days of King Hezekiah. As such, God told Isaiah about the fall of Assyria as well as how South Judah would be taken as captive to Babylon and then would later return to Jerusalem. All this was fulfilled when the captives returned from Babylon after 70 years. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. First point, Isaiah 11 verse 1 and Matthew 1 verse 1 are closely connected. Through Isaiah, God spoke of the Messiah from the household of David who would be born. A shoot will come out from the stump of Jesse. From his lotus, a branch will bear fruit. This was fulfilled 800 years later. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. God explained how the Messiah would bring peace. God furthermore told Isaiah about the people who were to remain. This was based on the return of the first group of captives during the Babylonian Empire. During the second return, the gospel was to spread all throughout the nation. God ultimately explained the coming of the kingdom of God. Fifth point, Isaiah pre-sang the song of victory for South Judah. Isaiah praised God after hearing about the coming of the Messiah. Indeed, God had waited a long time for this to happen. Isaiah pre-sang the song of saints on behalf of the people of South Judah. Isaiah sang that God was full of mercy and grace and that the people of South Judah will soon be able to experience this. Day 180, Isaiah 13 to 17, God's warning about all nations. God who declared judgment against Babylon, Assyria, Moab, and Aram was the sovereign who managed the whole world with love and justice. First point, God warned of all nations through Amos, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. God told Isaiah of his judgment for the surrounding countries of South Judah in chapters 13 to 23. 
The countries mentioned were Babylon, Assyria, Philistine, Moab, Aram, Egypt, Cush, Edom, Arabia, and also Tyre. God's message on this was spoken by Amos, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and also Ezekiel. The first target was Babylon. The content of their punishment can be found in Jeremiah 51, verses 28 to 29. Babylon was used by God to punish South Judah, but they became subject of judgment later on. Babylon had a lot of gold and silver, but nothing could save them from God's judgment. They were arrogant, and this was intolerable in God's eyes, as proclaimed by Isaiah in 539 BC. The Babylonian Empire fell in the hands of the Persian Empire. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of the Babylonians, for their guilt, declares the Lord, and will make it desolate forever. I will bring on that land all the things I have spoken against it. All that are written in this book and prophesied by Jeremiah against all the nations. Second point. God proclaimed judgment on Babylon, Assyria, and also Philistine. Through Isaiah, God explained that the people of South Judah would be taken as captive to Babylon for 70 years, and then they would return to Jerusalem. God also told him about the song they were to sing once they returned. This was a song of pre-victory. By pre-singing this, God told the people that although they were to be taken as captive, there will be the day they came back and sang this. During the time they heard this, South Judah was going through great distress and hardship. However, God wanted to tell them that they would be restored. After Babylon, God now spoke of Assyria's fall. As said, the people were arrogant and evil, Hence, their inevitable destruction. This was told in the year that Ahaz died. After a year from then, Assyria conquered the Philistine. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, conquered the remaining four cities, and Philistine later fell in the hands of Babylon. Third point, Isaiah lamented at God's news of the fall of Moab. God spoke of the fall of Moab through Isaiah. When Isaiah heard this, he lamented as Moab was Israel's brother country. During Exodus, God had told the Israel nation not to fight against Moab because they were brother countries. Isaiah therefore expressed his grief through a song of lament. Moab was a land given by God, and it could have been maintained in peace if they obeyed him, but due to their sins, they became the object of God's judgment. God is the God of love and righteousness, and no one can escape his judgment. Fourth point, the descendants of Lot showed continuous arrogance. God told Isaiah of the judgment on Moab and also a way they would be able to escape it. The only way for them was to work together with South Judah. For the Moab, they were to help the people of North Israel after they fell. But the arrogant Moab refused this proposal. Thus, they became the object of God's judgment. Moab did not listen to God until the end, and thus Isaiah sang his lamenting song. Moab worshipped their idols, and so they eventually also fell. God called out Moab in both Amos chapter 2 and also in Isaiah. The whole world belongs to God, and Moab was no exception. God did give them a warning beforehand. When they were still arrogant, God gave them three years. The reason God mentioned the three years as well as those who would remain was because as he waited for the people of South Judah to return to him, he also wanted the people of Moab to return to him. Fifth point, Isaiah once again emphasized the fall of Aram and North Israel. Now, God spoke about the judgment of Damascus. 
which was the capital city of Aram. This was indeed fulfilled. The king of Assyria complied by attacking Damascus and capturing it. He deported its inhabitants to Kerr and put resin to death. As such, God spoke about the judgment on Babylon, Assyria, Philistine, Moab, and Aram, and then returned to the judgment on North Israel. The reason North Israel had to fall was because they did not keep the covenant they made with God. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. But those who hate him, he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay to their face those who hate him. Day 181 Isaiah 18-20 Isaiah's three-year performance God told South Judah, to rely on only God instead of Egypt or Cushi through the naked performance of Isaiah. First point, God told Isaiah to carry out a performance in order to show the people of South Judah not to rely on Egypt or Cushi but only on God. Ahaz died and Hezekiah took his place as a king of South Judah. Cushi governed over Egypt, and they went into battle against Assyria with their extended army. But Cushi lost this war, and Assyria made Egypt and South Judah completely surrender to the Assyrian army. Assyria continuously threatened South Judah, and so Hezekiah made plans to make an alliance with Egypt. God tried to block this and so ordered Isaiah to walk around Jerusalem naked for three years. God tried to show through Isaiah's performance that Egypt and Cushi would be ridiculed as they were to be taken to Assyria in the days to come. Thus, South Judah was to only rely on God. Second point, Ahaz was a pro-Assyrian and his son Hezekiah was anti-Assyria, and so Hezekiah tried to make an alliance with Cushi. God explained that Cushi and Egypt would fall in the hands of Assyria. God's orders were clear. Assyria would conquer Aram and North Israel, but that would be as far as it goes. Therefore, God told South Judah to not make an alliance with Egypt. The overall message was that Assyria would fall as well. On the surface, it appeared that Assyria would attack and invade Jerusalem at any point, but God proclaimed that this would not happen, and that Assyria would also see a horrendous fall. In 8th century BC, Assyria was the most powerful empire, but even Assyria would not last a long time. In the future, all these powerful countries would end up bringing tribute to Mount Zion, where God resided. Third point, to Hezekiah, who wanted to make an alliance with Egypt, God told him that Egypt was to fall. When Assyria defeated Cushi, South Judah tried to make an alliance with Egypt. And so, God told Isaiah to tell South Judah of God's judgment on Egypt. This warning was also directed at South Judah. God said that Egypt would experience internal hardship and that their abundance would be gone. To think that the Nile would no longer supply abundance was a difficult thing to fathom at the time. Through this, the people were to understand that they were only to rely on God. As such, God told South Judah of what was to happen to Egypt and then explained through Isaiah that Egypt would fear South Judah after hearing God's words. God told Isaiah of his rule of the entire world and how peace would occur. 
fourth point, in order to prevent South Judah from making an alliance with Egypt, Isaiah went around South Judah naked for three years to make God's point. The circumstances during 8th century BC can be seen in 2 Kings 17 verse 6. Later on, when the Philistine wars became invaded, South Judah once again asked for help from Egypt and Cushy rather than God. In God's perspective, this was extremely serious, and here Isaiah made up his mind to do something which was very difficult. Isaiah, who was an esteemed scholar of those days, went to such measures in order to show the people that if they did not obey God, then they would be more ridiculed than the stripped and barefoot Isaiah. During the time of Isaiah, Assyria was dominating the religion and the newly emerging Babylonian Empire was finding ways to defeat Assyria. Amid these circumstances, Egypt was trying very hard to rise back up to their glory days, but the world did not operate according to them. Fifth point, Isaiah rebuked Hezekiah for his self-reliant ways and also for wanting to make an alliance with Egypt. During 8th century BC, when the ancient Near East political circumstances were booming, Hezekiah in South Judah was self-reliant, anti-Assyrian and pro-Egyptian. Isaiah therefore rebuked him and warned him. Isaiah told him that rather than being selfish, he should care for the weak and poor and practice leaving the edges of his field, according to the laws of a kingdom of priests. Isaiah told Hezekiah not to ignore the people who were relying on the Jerusalem walls for their lives. Isaiah also warned him not to be pro-Egyptian, but rather to have faith in God. Hezekiah was trying to make an alliance with Egypt, since offering tribute to Assyria was becoming more difficult. But despite being warned, Hezekiah did not stop his plans. 